Hey everyone, I'm Andy Petronic, and this is the Whole Life Challenge Podcast. It's the place we connect with extraordinary people, ones who think differently, who have risen to the top of their field, who have vast knowledge, experience, and insights to share, as well as incredible stories to tell. They are also the ones who have figured out a way to take their life's experience and turn it into something that truly makes a difference in the world for others. These are their stories. Hey gang, it's Andy Petronic, and welcome back to the Whole Life Challenge Podcast. This is episode number 120. Today I've got with me as a guest, Philip Folsom, and I've got to give you a little bit of a backstory. Uh, Philip was introduced to me by a good friend of mine. We happened to be sitting at breakfast, and I was telling him about an upcoming uh, event we were doing for our team, for our Whole Life Challenge um, staff. We'd never been all together in the same place at the same time and I I said we had this open window of a couple hours where we're trying to you know we're trying to do something impactful and profound and um, but we're we're, we're struggling with having to facilitate that ourselves and uh, he's like you've got to meet my friend Philip Folsom he's like he is the most amazing guy and what he does is work with teams he works with teams on developing culture on developing uh, wolf pack tribe mentality meaning uh, no lone wolf he works with them on mission and vision and values and he's been doing it for like 25 years he's the most probably the most experienced rope course ropes course leader in all of Southern California um, and uh you know what? I, I learned the difference between working with Philip Folsom and working with, with anyone else because we work with Philip. My team worked with Philip for a couple hours and then we went up and did a ropes course and we didn't have Philip and the difference was staggering. So, uh, Philip is, uh, well, you've already kind of caught what he's, what he is. He has worked with SpaceX he has worked with uh, with a, a, other really big companies. Um, the names are escaping me at this moment. Um, looking them up, looking them up, looking them up. Northrop Grumman, Apple, DreamWorks, uh, Sony, Microsoft, Red Bull North America. Um, he is, like I said, he develop, helps teams develop culture. This particular podcast, when I went back and listened to it, is... It's one of the most profoundly important conversations I think I've ever had. Um, it's about community and connection with people in your in your world, your neighbors, and and it, it, it's really we talk about a lot about what's missing in modern culture and why it's missing. And um, Philip brings a lot of insight into his experience in developing that. Um, couple highlights you know we talk about the lone wolf mentality and why it matters we talk about um finding your purpose finding your meaning in your work because we spend you know 80 percent of our time at work um how we can upgrade upgrade our operating systems we talk about conflict and accountability and how healthy conflict is is good it's important wolves learn how to bite but they don't hurt each other when they bite. So they, they, they know how to do that, and they, they bite in play. They bite in hard play and healthy conflict, but they don't hurt one another. Uh, we talk about the difference between compassion and sympathy, self-compassion. Um, and uh, I love this quote. I actually put it in the, the uh, podcast write-up. Uh, and this was something Philip says, said at the end of the podcast. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others an African proverb so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that that is a that's an intro to what's coming and um I hope you will you I know you're gonna get a lot out of this podcast I want to um introduce the fan of the week something I started about two months ago because I wanted to encourage you guys to leave ratings and reviews not just ratings but reviews like write-ups on in iTunes um if you want to do that and you want to be fan of the week go to bit.ly b-i-t dot l-y forward slash w-l-c dash podcast and it will open up your itunes and it will t- you, you'll have to click on ratings and reviews and you can leave a rating and review for us it really helps move the needle 
we want to get this podcast out in front of as many people as we can because the messages that our guests have are so important and so valuable uh, that that um, but we need your help to do that. So the fan of the week this week is his name is well his screen name and his Apple screen name is Coach Guyton. Um, Coach writes. Bobby Gill's passion for a healthier earth is commendable. The facts detail, detailed were startling, yet gave me hope about the things humans can do to help our earth. I was under the impression that consuming beef was bad for our land, period. Bobby further explained that it is not the cows that are damaging to our environment by releasing methane via burping, but it is the way we humans manage the land that these cows graze on that's the true culprit. If we focused on maintaining land in a more ecological fashion, this will help keep the land healthy. In returns, in return, animals will be healthier. The land will be more fertile, and there will be more. There will be less methane released into the environment. And there are more details in the podcast on how to do that. Thanks, Andy, for having Bobby discuss and help s- explain such an imperative topic. Thank you, Coach. I really appreciate your review and you taking the time to do it. And remember, anybody else out there that wants to leave one, super big kudos. Uh, right now, we don't take any sponsors of the of the Whole Life Pod, Whole Life Challenge podcast. Um, so our sponsor is the Whole Life Challenge, and we are gearing up for a spectacular ch- New Year's challenge. It begins on January twentieth. You can go to our website, wholelifechallenge.com, to sign up. Um, it will be big. It will be this. This will be the first challenge ever. That's six weeks. Very excited about that. And through the year, there will be a six week on, six week off cycle. I've written about that in my blog. Um, it's it's um, it's a really really powerful way to engage for long term sustainable change. Six on, six off. Six on, six off. Six weeks on of accountability. Six weeks off of relaxation and rest and recovery and 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 uh, growth, and um, and then repeat. So that's our new that's our new focus. That's our new strategy, and um, look forward to implementing that in 2018. So uh, without further ado, I want to bring in um, Philip. You're going to love it. So um, without further ado, here he is, the one, the only, Philip Folsom. This one would get along with my dog very well. All right. So, yeah, but there's really nobody that Odie doesn't get along with. He, yeah. um, he makes friends with everybody. He, I mean, he lives for being petted. He lives for being in your lap. Yeah. Um, yeah, bread he's for just it. Super sweet, and he, and the funny thing about Odie being that that he's a pug is there are no facial expressions ever, huh. so you don't know what he, his eyes brows don't raise. You don't, you can't really see his eyes because they're these black marbles, mm. and so they don't really. There's no indication of anything other than, you know, sometimes he does a head to head tip. Mm. <laughs> he's a sweetie though. Yeah, he is. Edible. He's a love dog. Looks kind of. Perfect for a meal for two. Just a little, you know. They, they used to eat chihuahuas. They, it was like a, it was a stock animal. Really? In in uh, Mexico. I didn't know that. <clears throat> Mexico has almost no. In fact, North America has almost no domesticated animals. Huh. Yeah. So they had the turkey. Right. That was it. Right. So they act. So the dog was bred as a meat animal. So the chihuahua was a meat animal in um, Mexico. It, but the funny thing is it doesn't have much meat on it. I know. It's, it's funny. Strange, but I think Odie's they were, got a lot more meat on them. They, they were chubbier and fatter. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe was a, they look more like pugs. <clears throat> Maybe. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to talk about no. that. Uh, we could talk about that. No. But, um, well, it's one of the reasons It's also, not why I invited you on, but hey, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the reasons why... Okay, hey, I'll launch off into a strange journey, but I'll come back. I'm coming back to the All wolves. Right. So the... Um, we're talking about North America real quickly and, and that we didn't have any domesticated animals. I'm Native American, Choctaw. And <clears throat> so it turns out that almost all of our diseases come from our domesticated animals. They made that cross-species jump hmm. from when we look at um, you know cows, sheep, horses, pigs. We got all of our, anim- our diseases from our domesticated animals, which is the reasons why in the... Europe and Asia and even Africa, North Africa, they've had a chance, humans, to evolve a certain amount of resistance to smallpox and the rest of the diseases, which is why as soon as we showed up in North America, 
why it was catastrophic for the population there. What they did have is wolves. So that's that was the 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 only probably purely holistic uh, animal that we partnered with that didn't give us diseases was the wolf. Why why did why would they be exempt from the disease faction? Uh, well, obviously, I mean, you could look at fleas, I guess, but that's not really a disease right. component. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't know how that, that's why that dynamic worked. But a lot of a lot of my work is with wolves in terms of the, what they have to teach us. Right. And so it is a very reciprocal relationship. Uh, the wolves would actually follow us. We would actually follow the wolves. And you can factor in the third part of that re relationship equation, which is the ravens. In hmm. all of North America, ravens, wolves, and humans had this kind of triangulated um, hunting, scavenging, teaching, and, and it was included in all of the mythology. Hmm. And so it was Why a relationship raven? that was Why not extractive. Ravens were scavengers? Yeah, ravens are... <clears throat> uh, and there was actually evidence of ravens being the ones who because of their eyesight and their height perspective, were able to see certain things and communicate them via language to the wolves. Right. And the wolves would therefore make the kills. They're the hitters. And then the ravens get to scavenge off that. Right. So there's this, you know, symbiotic relationship that, uh, and again, humans inc uh, jumped into that cycle where th the humans would actually follow the wolves. The, wol the humans were able to, uh, because of our technology, implement kills that the wolves could not, because we had at right. that point right. bows and arrows. We could run, we could also run animals over cliffs, like the bison that right. Native Americans killed, you know, just extraordinarily well. Yep. And we would leave uh, a portion to the animal for the wolves, ah. and so it was a very symbiotic relationship. Huh. Um, and it it was not extractive, which means we're going to take everything we can from you, including right. your fur, your your flesh, everything, uh, like we have with the rest of our domesticated animals, which is they are basically meat slaves yeah, right. to humans. Right. <clears throat> Pretty toxic, dark. Right. right. The meat industry. I don't want to put a bummer on the whole audience, but that would... It can be. I mean, I, it's yeah. funny. I just had a guest on the podcast um, um, who, um, Bobby Gill, who works for the Savory Institute, and they are, they are in the process of transforming America's grasslands through mm. the practice of sustainable farming and grassland management mm -hmm. with their cattle, with their beef, yep. and so, that, so that it is a symbiotic relationship, so that, that the cattle do the, the way they farm and the way they practice management of, of the manure and the, and the movement of the cattle through the grasslands and yeah. mobile electric fences and you know, kind of how they utilize the, the land, being respectful of the land and mm -hmm. being respectful of the animal. Um, it's a whole, different, it's a whole and different thing. There And a large topic now about uh, looking at reintegrating some of the wolves, which inherently, you know, fix the ecosystems mm -hmm. with that trophic cascade. And how can we cohabitate with these animals and still maintain uh, all of our livestock beef industry? And it right. turns out that uh, there are some ways that you can, for instance, leave horns on your cattle. You can breed animals that are correct for that terrain. Sure. And also are going to be a little bit more belligerent and defend themselves against wolves. And all of a sudden, you've basically recreated a much more uh, dynamic, healthy, and sustainable relationship yeah, and right. environment. Which is really, you know, I mean, even from the sense of self-worth of, of uh, a cowboy, mm -hmm. right? That's how you want to live. You want to be in a meat industry just raising mindless meat animals that you're right. just going to kill and cycle through. So uh, there's a nice quality of life conversation that is involved in throughout that whole piece of things that are sustainable, things that are uh, inherently uh, symbiotic. Well, they're natural. Romance to them and they're natural. natural. It's yeah. funny. It's funny because as soon as humans came into the picture, we we denaturalized things, you know, like we, oh, yeah. we, 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 we in our in our desire to make them more efficient or mm -hmm. better or more you know, economical, um, and more productive, mm -hmm. we change things and yeah. <laughs> we change things. And now it's, now we have this big movement to go back to 
let's make things the way they used to be and, and yeah. still give us the ability to be practical in the way we are are you know raising animals for our consumption you know so yeah we're a culture that wants not only immediate gratification but we want to avoid any darkness any right. shadow any right. discomfort yeah and that's, we don't want to and you and i are both veterans um so we're in a a culture that generally people want to say thank you for your service now move on right here's your gi bill right right and so we don't even want to know the that we're at war right now yeah in multiple countries right and most people are unable to even list who we're at war with at the moment yeah we don't want to talk about so how does that state get brought to whole foods how does that happen right you know it's a very good question because there is a cycle into a, a sort of a yin yang oh yeah there's some things that are dark and scary but that's the reason why they're light and extraordinary and yeah. amazing it, it and the that desperate shallow sort of hollowness that i see so many people expressing in life that can only be solved by going into some darkness yeah and and uh, one one of the topics we discussed is um that magnificent book iron john mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it takes releasing the wild man from the cage um to be able to get your gold ball back to have your innocence the magic the inspiration and we know that the wild man is scary we know we're going to get hurt at some point mm -hmm. but we will receive inspiration or the spirit will enter us in the same way that if you've never heard a wolf howl it's worth a cow if you, you know, it, it's, it's worth it to know how our meat is processed. It's important to know that we've sent soldiers across the sea and they're right. there now. Right. These are all things that are uncomfortable, but there is a sense of romantic glory in, interwoven in all of these subjects. Which I think it's hard um, to open yourself up to knowing those things because there's a feeling of not knowing what to do with it mm -hmm. or what, you know, what do you do with that knowledge? What do you, when you, when you're really confronted with the, with the, um, magnitude, uh, um, and the, and the, the, um, un there's an uncomfortableness, you know, and it's hard, it's hard for people to hold that. It's hard for people to want to hold that, you know, I'm not talking about people outside of here. It's hard for me to hold that. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, not, you know, I, I don't think that's a, I don't think I'm immune to that. I think it's a human, it's a very human thing. Yeah. Or, or it, maybe it was more, maybe a thousand years ago when we were more hunting and gathering all the time, maybe that was a little easier then. Perhaps we were more connected to the natural. I mean, I, I would think that even, in, even George Washington, when, when I went back last summer to visit his home, you know, I mean, they're killing chickens and they're, you know, he's a farmer. He's, yeah. you know, and I think the further we get away from, those connections to our food chain and the connections to fighting for our property, fighting for our protecting our own, what we, who we are. Yeah. We, the, the, the harder it is to, for people to hold. Hey, I, I don't want, I, this is a fascinating topic, but I want yeah. to introduce people to what you do oh. and why you're here. <laughs> okay. Guys, this is Philip Folson and I've, I've already done an introduction. So, you know, a little okay. bit more than what, you know, but, um, I was introduced to you from, um, my friend Clark and uh, Clark was so it was funny because we were I was looking to um, do some team some team building we had we had never had a corporate retreat before and I was talking to Clark we were having breakfast and I was telling him about the retreat coming up and and um, I was talking about facilitating these conversations about vision and values and mission and he's like Andy he goes you've got to talk to Philip Folsom <laughs> And he goes, in fact, I'm going to text him right now. I'm like, wait, wait a second. <laughs> I don't know if I want to talk to that. Who is, who's Philip Folsom? And, you know, like, what are you getting me into here, Clark? And um, as it turned out, you know, he, he, he basically said, Philip, you're going to work with Andy. You're going to take his team through a, through a process. And you, you were like, okay, I'm in. And I was like, okay, I'm in. I don't know what I'm in for, but, um, you know, the process, what the, the one piece of feedback from my entire team. So we had a team of 11 people go through this team building weekend was we want to work more with Philip Folsom. And, um, um, 
you were, you know, just the, the way that you came in and kind of gave a, a foundational context for our team and your, your, your breadth of experience and knowledge around building team, um, you know, was just, was, was amazing. And uh, it was obvious, you know, it was obvious that you, you have a lot of depth to the, to the work that you do and a lot of authenticity to the work you do. And so I, I'd love for you to kind of just describe your, you know, how, you, what, what you do, how you do what you do, like other than you're the wolf guy, which is the easy way to just yeah. say who you are, but I'd love to hear it more from your mouth. What? All right. Well, um, my name is Philip Folsom. <laughs> there you go. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. I already touched on the base uh, that um, veteran, yeah, and yes. the you know I, I guess technically I'm an anthropologist, I'm a culture development expert. I, I do leadership trainings with uh, intact work teams. I do trauma processing with veterans. Uh, I do a lot of suicide prevention. The I guess the the nut of what I'm working at is. Uh, alleviating suffering in the world, um, healing the world. And I think the analogy of that is we all have a, a particular lens through which we view our lives and that lens creates our reality. And so earlier when we were talking about not wanting to engage with anything that's dark or uncomfortable and we can't hold that amount of energy that there's a worldview in that in that when we get this immediate gratification of oh i get likes and follows and bings on my phone uh, that's a, a particular lens that provides an immediate little sense of of purpose and validation but it doesn't it, it, it's turning out to not be a particularly long-term holistic healthy resilient Mm -hmm. mindset so what are the things that create people and cultures to be healthy and uh, in my work in anthropology and my experience of being part of sports teams and military units is <clears throat> there is a a tangible sense of meaning to be around a group of people who have a common mission that they're working on together mm -hmm. in a collaborative sense not in a casual, opportunistic way, but in something that's larger than ourselves, something that's vitally important. And we've only come together like that as a country a few times against some big common enemy yep. or with a common cause. Let's get to the moon. Let's defeat the Nazis. Let, there's a few big things. Mm -hmm. And I call that hunting big game. Human beings have a desire psychologically to do something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those reasons that uh, people have a vague sense of dissatisfaction when they look at their lives and they feel, ah, something's missing. I need to go find something to fulfill me or to provide purpose or meaning. What's, what is the purpose of life? And so I, I guess people do end up searching for larger uh, more weighty questions of faith and service and relationships. But most of the time, we'll just consume the junk food that society has given us as meaning. Well, how many Instagram followers do you have? Mm -hmm. That's kind of a junk food uh, response to here's your meaning. And so if we don't define what our own meaning is then it will be defined for us by other people that the and it's about money now the thing that provides meaning for humans is our culture which is why i, I have taken a deep dive into culture development and understand trying to ascertain what are the components that build a an intact culture and how do we upgrade that and what is uh, a more functional culture and so the, the three big components, one is having that common mission, hey, let's get to the moon, which by the way, that's the basically the, the mission statement or the vision statement of SpaceX. And it's one of my clients, when I walk in to say SpaceX, uh, 
there's a host of big key markers about performance from that industry. People are wearing SpaceX clothing and they don't have to be. Yeah. People are highly motivated, they're engaged, uh, retention is high, uh, innovation is high. There's a whole slew of just like anthropological markers of a high functioning culture. I, w I just went down there, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. One of my clients at the gym uh, is their lead software engineer. He runs the whole software team. Yeah. And uh, he invited me down for a tour. They get, they do tours on like, I don't know, Tuesday and Thursday nights. Worth doing. It was amazing. I They're, mean, it was, it was amazing. It was um, seeing it on TV or YouTube uh, versus seeing it in person. It, it just, of course, of course it's different. <laughs> yeah. And how big are those rockets? Oh my God. It's, ama it's amazing that they yeah. do it right there. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the funny thing is it would seem to me that you would build it next to the launch pad so that you wouldn't have the logistics right. of having to get it around the country. But, but my, my friend um, explained that, that Elon Musk's vision is to, you know, go to Mars. Yeah. And if you're going to go to Mars, you need multiple rockets launching simultaneously. So building the logistics into moving these rockets around the country was part of the, mm -hmm. part of the requirement. Yeah. So it didn't really matter where the plant was. Let's put the plant where it's best to put the plant. And then be build in the efficiency and the ability to ship these rockets to different launch pads so they can all launch simultaneously and head to Mars yeah. together. And the guy making the espresso for the workers is right next to the guy making the rocket engines. Right. Uh, literally. L literally. It's, yeah. uh, ten, it's 20 feet between yeah. the and espresso not, machine. And, and they're the... not wearing you know, paper outfits like in right. NASA. They're right. like, nope, if you build these things right, you don't need to have it be that precious. Right. And they're careful. They're, they're they were careful about not letting us pass. There was a blue line on the painted on the thing. Right, don't but, go past but it the wasn't like line. a hyperbaric chamber where no, it was like no. <laughs> except NASA. the except the um, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Except there, except the one room where that's an exception was the three D printing room, which was so cool. What they're uh -huh. able to manufacture. Yeah. I mean, they, the guys that were in the room were wearing these hooded. Uh, you know, full on coats and then these hoods and the hoods had a rebreather in it because uh, I guess the your 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 breath and your hands and all that stuff could affect the three D printing. But man, they're three D printing things that are I mean, just like astounding. Well, um, the 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 fine the fine you couldn't have done it. You could not have done this before three D printing existed. Yeah, um, that's you a, that's make a, a huge mold. industry. Yeah, revolutionary. Uh, the, 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 the part that really s speaks to the cohesiveness of that is that they want that guy making espressos to be as engaged as the guy running the wrench. Right. They, they want full engagement because they know that. And by the way, um, the contemporary uh, num figure on that is only 20 percent of Americans are fully engaged in their jobs which means 80% of us are working because we have to work. We've settled for some job that is out of alignment with our true passion. And we're hoping to find some sort of meaning after work or on the weekends. And so for me, I think that that has, we have surrendered the center mass of our lives because where do we spend the most time at work at work? Right. And so, if we have relegated work to just work and anytime that I can't, I find myself using the word just, mm -hmm. I've kind of trained myself to catch that and go. So what was it I really wanted? If I just said, use the word just, there was something else that I really wanted that for some reason I didn't think I was worthy or so it's just work. And that's, I think that's the one of the sources of the tragedy that I'm going to throw my remaining years at. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of fires here in Los Angeles, and there's a great fire analogy that I use a lot in my work, and that is if you want to put out a house fire, <clears throat> uh, you don't just spray water all over the out of the house. It just never will go out. You have to kick a hole in the roof, mm -hmm. and you have to get to the fire source. Mm -hmm. So the, the fire source for me is people's job. It's where they spend eight hours a day plus, and that's the fire source. That's the that's the you know, the, that stove that caught fire. And mm -hmm. I want to put resources on that. And other people, 
uh, have a different perspective of what is the fire source. Is it your spiritual well-being? Is it your uh, physicality? Or mm -hmm. is it what you're eating? I mean, these are all completely legitimate um, whole life challenge conversations. Yep. Incredibly yep. uplifting, holistic way of looking at the world. Uh, you know, my kind of sequencing that is, okay, meaning, lack of meaning, I, I believe is the source of most people's pain. Now, that's not true in <clears throat> third world countries where you're not making enough food to, or money for food. Then it's poverty. So poverty is the number one driver of trauma in the world. Right. But I can't change poverty right now with, you know, maybe we can talk to Elon about that. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is I can take my experience of doing leadership and team building and culture development, and I can address the other big meaning, which is... <clears throat> Uh, a, a lack of purpose. Is that another way of saying kind of making want the desire to make a difference? Absolutely. Like, yeah. That's, that's my piece of that. Yep. That's my, that's me going to Mars and right. I would go to Mars, by the way, would you go to Mars? Would that's you go? That's a really good question. Mm. You mean like to, if you invited Six me today months. to hop on the yep. ship? To Six go? months. You don't get to see your boy. Right. Mm. That'd be tough. That'd be a tough, tough, tough decision. Would I be up? Would I yep. come home or unknown? Well, you would potentially come home, but they say you don't climb Everest unless you're willing to lose a pinky. Yeah, right. So go to Mars, six months, and you're going to lose a pinky. And I'm coming home in six months. I'll be home. Or I'll be in Mars in six. It'll take me six months to get there. Mm, that's a, Yeah, six months, round trip. Round trip. Okay. Uh, you're going to lose a pinky, and there's a chance you won't because people die on Everest all the time. Right. Okay, so. Um, yeah, your name. If I if I if I had to answer right this moment, I'd say nay. Mm. Family, it's just too important to me to 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 miss. There you go. I've made decisions in the last year that have uh, for things that would occupy weekend time and mm -hmm. you know being around sports games and whatnot with my son. That I just don't. I, I only have one. I only have one chance. I don't have five kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm only watching this one kid go through and I only have this one chance. And so I'm, uh, I'm now ask me again in like five years, mm -hmm. it might be a different answer, yeah. but <clears throat> the, uh, one of the topics that I use in my work is, is looking at what the common values are because your common values are the large deciders of culture. So when we're looking at, team building or sports or, or working with a, a, a church or anything else, you need to have common values because values are the things that we navigate towards whatever that common mission is. Mm -hmm. uh, and values are uh, a fascinating dynamic where of if you pop the hood on your, your psyche and take a look at what your value systems are, they are the things that really create your worldview. And so uh, when we look at the word decide that that word holds the latin root of side in it which means to cut or kill mm -hmm. so when we decide something the cost of that decision is what we would have chosen right so you would kill your trip to mars yeah. because your son is that important yes that's a profound statement so and now all of a sudden just through th that particular conversation you're able to take a look at what is that cascading list of my priorities of my life and yep. this starts building out uh, a worldview and if we can do that collectively with our teams now all of a sudden we're able to navigate through all these different choices how do I deal with my customer service how do I deal with innovation how do I deal with failure how do I deal with commitment these are all components of <clears throat> how do we go through the day-to-day -day things so that they do provide meaning mm -hmm. and they do provide something that's larger than ourselves. Right. Right. So Can yeah, values that? are a wonderful. How do you do that with piece. a team when so many of the members of a team have not figured out their own values? Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of psychological thought about this, that people are unable to integrate or align with company values unless they've done a little bit of that themselves. Yeah. And which is one of the reasons why when corporations throw up, you know, three or four pretty words on the wall, 
and they go, oh, it's we have integrity and customer service, right? And it do, and then you don't see that being being held as an actual defining piece. Is because they people have not fully done their own work on that, and they have not been through what I would call an initiation process. An initiation is again the death of an old thing, hmm. so you can accept a new thing like and in our contemporary culture we don't want to have the death of anything oh i'd rather keep that option open well that's to keep all options open you can't commit you can't grow you can't live you can't choose it's it's what the military marine corps especially Mm -hmm. forces on you absolutely you go to boot camp and you're initiated you've you've left behind that person that you were before Mm -hmm. you came in they've you know it's represented by your haircut Mm -hmm. and your and you're you know, getting rid of your clothes and you know you are now one of them and it, and when we talk about uh lifestyle whole life challenge components people want to have their all of their good pleasure based things and they still want to be able to oh, but i wish i had abs like yeah, andy right, right but i still, i'd still want to eat that pizza right well you don't get both one right. of those dies right your abs die or the pizza dies choose you know, decide one of those away. And then, of course, the act of deciding there is going to be suffering involved in that, right? There's pain. And that's what we don't want to touch because the darkness is so, uh, air quotes, wrong. Oh, there, oh, that was uncomfortable. I did something wrong. It's not wrong. It's, it, there's, it, there's tremendous healing in steering your ship right into that darkness and then punching out the other side. How do you do that, though? If you are not, you know, signing up to go into a boot camp and you're not or you don't have a Philip Folsom to work with, what 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 does someone do that um, there's so much benefit to doing it with a group? Oh, vital. I couldn't have made it through a boot camp no. if it was by myself. Oh, hell I mean, <laughs> no, you can't no, do it. No, no question. I you can't quit. get in shape by yourself. You cannot. Uh, um, you cannot develop even a spiritual practice by yourself. There is nothing that human beings can do by themselves. So how do you, what do you do? What you do you have you to, find, find a tribe, you have find to a build group. a tribe, build yeah. a tribe, build yeah. a tribe, <clears throat> build a tribe. Yeah. It is how big is a tribe? A tribe is, it's a good question. Um, basically up to about 120. Okay. So I would, in anthropology, they would, anything that's less than about a dozen, you call a band. I like the term hunting party. Oh, really? Yeah. The band. Like, oh, yeah. Get, get, the like, band. Like you it and reminds I, me of the Blues Brothers. Kind of. <laughs> like, like you and I right now would be hunting partners. Uh-huh. We would be, we would be a, a, a band or a partnership. Oh, there's those two humans that are working on a project together, making a podcast, solving some problems. Uh, when we get together with you and Clark and Richie, now all of a sudden we're edging into full-on hunting party. Include our women in this, in this category. Now we have a tribe. Right. That means we go on vacations together. Hey, where's right. your kids going to school? Hey, do you know a good therapist? Hey, do you know a, you know what are you what are you drinking right. in in that protein shake? And that, all of a sudden, we get now access to the genius of humanity, which is our collective intelligence. It, it's the it's the one thing that gave us the planet is our collective intelligence. It's not our stupid opposable thumbs. Uh, our our prefrontal cortex, our big brains, our problem-solving, reason-based brains are a after product. It wasn't the driver of our dominion. Right. It, was, it, it came well after. Um, the, the, the primary wheelhouse transcendent gift, and you can take this as spiritual or evolutionary, however you want to take it, is... We have collective intentionality, which means that we can imagine a future that does not exist. We can symbolically share that future with each other and cooperate together to make it happen. We're the only animals that can do that. And it didn't require the, our, the, imp- the, the brain power that we have now. That actually came later. So uh, there's not much difference between uh, a two- or three-year-old infant in terms of iq and a chimpanzee they're about the same in terms of their problem solving abilities what uh, that two or three year old human infant does when trying to solve some sort of little um you know iq challenge of opening a box 
they're able to work collaboratively. Even with a bunch of the two or three year olds. Hey, you try this, hold that, give me the stick, you push it. The, they can solve it. Chimpanzees can't. That's what stops them is that they can't end up working together to be able to collaborate and solve a problem. Right. So the problem that we have is that because we live in this giant mega culture that is forcing us to be around strangers all the time, we've, inst- we've surrendered our group tribal dynamic and we've adopted a very dysfunctional uh, societal worldview, which is the lone wolf. So we, we right now sitting in the heart of Los Angeles, surrounded by 10 million people. And most of us don't know the names of our neighbors. Ouch. And Wait a second. I'm feeling kind of guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know Mike next door. Yeah. I know Scott next door. Yeah. I know, I know, um, and yet, Susan across the street. I know, um, shout out to Mike next door. I know Paula and Alex across the street. Um, so I know but my, it pretty much stops there though. Huh? It pretty much, I know, I know yeah. the next house down, yeah. but after that, it's pretty much gone. Yeah. I just met Manny up the street oh, who came down from my job. yard sale. There you go. Uh, but I wasn't Smart. my doing, he came down, so I didn't, agre- I didn't go out and yeah. find him. And you are one of the more, um, you know, social humans out there. Perhaps Come on, you are, I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny is because I, in my work with Richard, I, um, I'm very much of a, when left to my natural state, my curmudgeon I'm very curmudgeon and mm-hmm. I like to stay at home. I keep the door shut. I don't want to go out in public. I don't want to go to parties. I don't want to have parties. I don't want to be around people. But when I'm around them, I thrive. Yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in complete joy. I'm in complete harmony. I, lo- I absolutely love it. Um, and yet I f- constantly forget. You yeah. know, like I'd much rather be in my little it, cavern. It's a, re, it's a very good awareness to realize that uh, when we are being asked to go to a party with, you know, a bunch of strangers in a room, it's an incredibly anxiety producing thing. There's very few things that are more anxiety producing than being around strangers. And speaking and, in front of strangers maybe is, is more, <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know. For some of us, it's actually easier speaking. I'd rather speak to, large groups of people than those one-on-one strangers. Interesting. Oh, it's uncomfortable. Huh. It's one of the reasons why we have, why alcohol is so prevalent hmm. and why we tend to uh, text people instead of calling them. Ooh, right. 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 And I know a lot of us do that. Like, Oh, it's much safer and easier just totally. to send that little text out than actually engage with a human relationship. Yep. Le- relationships are tricky and they're scary and they're scary because we have, we have become so siloed uh, in our our behaviors and our, our specializations that we don't have to connect, and so we don't. Yeah. And so the, the tribe building piece is, um, from a professional standpoint, is vital for success. You have to start uh, making people realize that they need to be collaborative, they need to hunt big game together, they need to be understanding where their North star is so that when we're navigating through all these life challenges that we can refer back to something that's larger and more uplifting and we can navigate off of that. Like, Oh, we're trying to get to Mars, trying to get to Everest. We're trying to end suffering, whatever your North star is. And if the people in your tribe don't share that with you, then there's, going to be a diffused sense of purpose which is why we don't know our neighbors because we don't they all have different north stars they have different Uh value systems they have different missions except maybe hey let's bring our trash cans in at the end of the week because it looks ugly that's that's basically where it stops so if we want to start getting to that tribal place we need to start finding out hey so where are you from what do you think about that what do you you know what are you working on what 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 ignites you what can I partner with on with you? All of these things are strange sounding, but they're in- inherently healing at the same time. When I hear you say that, I immediately think, well, I'm already in a tribe. Mm. I already have enough tribes. Mm. Um, why would I want to be in a tribe with my neighbors? Or 
the God, that seems like an overwhelming amount of work because mm. I don't have a collective mission for my neighborhood. I, I, I mean, I can't think, you know, Sandy and Mike and Scott and, you know, we're not, um, we're not that connected anyway. So, um, <laughs> well, again, how am I going to create some mission that I don't even know, you know, like, and, how, and why, how, why do and, I need to know how the cow that you created those steaks was killed? Like, I don't need to know that. Like, I don't need to carry that up. I'm sure. Engage with that. Yeah. Right. You don't have to. It's just available. Right. Do I really want to know where my food came from? Do I really want to, you know, care about what I'm eating? Do I really want to deal with the bigger questions of community and all those components? Right. Right. And so we are shuffling through a life in many ways of some quiet desperation. And and there is a sense of dis-ease in our in our society uh, there's something missing uh, and I, I think if I were to ask everybody to listen to that like you know there's something missing and I don't want to start sounding like the matrix right but you always knew mm -hmm. like you know there's something off yeah and so what is that thing what is what, what's off and no I don't think it's the matrix I don't think that there's you know the aliens or whatever, but mm -hmm. there is something that is missing in our society. And so is, has, it, has it always been missing? I think, well, <clears throat> I think since agriculture, yes. What, what does agriculture have to do with it? Well, now we're going to get all weird, but, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, I, I can't help it. Yeah. Well, we've spent, oh, 10 million years hunting and gathering and we're perfectly adapted for it. We're really, really good at dealing with uh, everything in this world. We're perfectly adapted for this world. Uh, and when we look at tribal cultures, and by tribal, um, the Marines are a tribe, tribe culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're gonna say, we're gonna push it older, like Amazon Basin, Kalahari, uh, way back country um, in the outback in uh, Australia. Those are the, Last few, you know, semi-indigenous paleolithic cultures. And that's us. That's our last link to the past. Mm -hmm. And even, even those, you know, the, you know, Kalahari, way in the southern Africa, they still dealt with anthropologists for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. So they know technology and they know right. there is no more pure tribes right. uh, that are, right. uh, you know, Stone Age paleolithic right the new stone age mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but when we study them what we're seeing is there's no diabetes none there's right. no um cancer there's no clinical anxiety or depression they still have all their, they still not, have all their teeth that's always one interesting thing for me a lot of the like, time they don't floss they don't brush they right. don't have fluoride they don't yeah. they don't they don't yeah. see the dentist, the dentist every six months almost no heart disease almost right. no cancer almost not like what kills primitive people like and they're not primitive um again that's a societal term yeah. right because yeah. we're advanced yeah. like oh no we're not we've actually we are actually much less healthy than they are so, it's like that picture of the of the ape at the desk and the way we've we've evolved to a standing and then and then we've devolved down into this sitting pop forward head posture, you know, like chiropractor. You see that yeah. in the chiropractor's office okay. a lot. Yeah. You know, the dev the devol de evolution. De devolution? De evolution de yeah. of the of the strong, capable, you know, hunter gatherer man down to this yeah. guy that sits at a desk all day and yeah, it's where, where were we with that? Oh, um, agriculture. So we yeah. are perfectly adapted. Um, the things that kill primitive humans are basically parasites um, and tooth decay. Right? If you get if you get tooth or decay, big or or big animals or eh, you know like wild nah, no nothing really eats us. Hmm. Polar bears eat us. Crocodiles eat us. Lions maybe. No, actually, no, really. No. And here's a weird one. Um, 
Human beings are the, are the most lethal, deadly, and effective predators on the planet. Right. So when we showed up in Australia 45,000 years ago, mass extinction. Uh, 95% of the megafauna of that continent were exterminated by us. And the few, I mean, there was, a, there was, an, there was an incredible uh, list of these giant super marsupials. Like our big ground sloths and all sorts of weird mm -hmm. giant marsupial creatures. And we killed them all, except for the kangaroos, which managed to be fast enough to escape us. But we killed everything else. Uh, we did the same thing in Europe. We did the same thing in Asia. When we crossed the land bridge in North America, we wiped out everything there. And we continued all the way down to South America. So we wiped out um, all the megafauna of every continent that we've ever been to except when you mentioned lions africa still has its mega fauna mm -hmm. the only only continent and and it's proposed that they still have uh rhinos and elephants and you know, all these the big things mm -hmm. because human beings evolved out of africa and right. so right. We, we left we left we well we developed our lethal collaborative hunting skills in Africa. And so the rest of the animals had time to evolve with us so that they learned that uh. we were deadly and we were lethal and stay away. The other continents didn't have that chance. So when we showed up, they were sitting ducks. Right. And the same way that the inverse is also true that, you know, when we had all the Europeans show up with all these diseases that we had developed a certain amount of resistance for, the Native Americans were decimated by smallpox right. and the rest of the diseases. Yeah. We didn't have time, or the animals didn't have time to be able to evolve any response to that. So humans, take coming around full circle, we are perfectly evolved for this world. And that's taken us millions of years. Uh, we don't have time to evolve to solve the problems right now. We cannot evolve to deal with a, with a warmer climate. We cannot evolve to deal with pollution. We cannot evolve to deal with the amount of crap that's in our food. Because it's happening too fast. It's too fast. Yeah. So we can evolve culturally. This will be our salvation, is that we do have the ability to upgrade the operating system of our culture. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm on the planet right now. This is what I'm trying to do. Now, agriculture, which hit roughly 10,000 years ago, uh, is a very, very recent occurrence. And so it's artificial. It's an artificial uh, way of living. And in the same way that living in uh, a big, packed, high-density housing system is very artificial. You take too many rats and you put them in a cage, and eventually they start raping each other and cannibalizing each other. Hmm. That's, that's what happens when you put too many animals together in an, in an artificially uh, compacted area. So... There's a lot of stuff that we're experimenting with and we're playing with as humans with our planet and with our species that is very, very strange. Uh, Pre-agriculture, we had about 8 million, 10 million humans hunting and gathering around the planet, very low impact. And then within a 1,000 years in Mesopotamia, we had 10 times that amount of mm -hmm. humans because all of a sudden you could grow more food, you could have more offspring, then you needed to start protecting all that food. Oh, mm -hmm. and then you have a non-diversified food source, which now you're dealing with, we're, un we're unhealthy. We're eating one crop instead of 30 different crops. So you're just, you're doubled down on rice or wheat or corn. And it, then we're physically unhealthy mm -hmm. at that point. Now you're dealing with, oh, I need to have a military to protect my resources because other people are going to want to come in and get my grain. So now all of a sudden we need to have, you know, professional armies. And that, that leads to this whole big um, cascade of dysfunctional kind of aberrative stuff. And the biggest one from a culture development standpoint, uh, and we're not even touching about religion, that whole, the basically organized religion when it, when it moved from being animist, which is, uh, an animist belief is that everything has a soul. So mm -hmm. 
the trees outside of your house are so beautiful. Like those have a soul. Mm-hmm. This this valley of Los Angeles has a soul. You don't you don't you don't wreck it. You know, and the animals have souls. That's animism. That which means we're part. There is no different. We're not better right. than the you know the deer that walks by. It's we're just part of this big system. The moment agriculture hits, when you can see organized religions that put human beings above all the rest of that. So um, the biggest one is we can only maintain tri- uh, authentic tribal relationship systems from about 120 people. So now you start dealing with, instead of this nice tight, tight tribe where all oh, your beautiful neighbors, you know them all, you know their kids, there's accountability, mm-hmm. you know what their strengths are, their challenges, they, you can rely on them. Like not just a cup of sugar, but listen, I got a problem. I, and you can call back up and you've got you've got the the 30 men that live within a stone's throw of you will come to your aid to protect your dwelling that's badass yeah but that is badass, you don't yeah. dare ask right. you, you probably don't even ask hey i need to get my car jumped Ooh. Right. hey sorry to bug right. you sorry right. to bug you brother <clears throat> get, hey I, I need a car jump yeah our power went out yesterday completely randomly and i was out well, I was here when the power went out, but then I left the house and I didn't want to come back home if the power was still out. And I thought, well, who can I call? Yeah. And then I thought, well, oh, I've never called Scott before, mm. but I got his number in my nice. phone and I, I texted him, of course. Right. Yeah. A little less, a little more. Actually, wait. <clears throat> Give him I a called chance to get him. Out. I called him. He texted me back. Right. Um, and he told me that the power was back on. So yeah. I came home. But, um, but yeah, I it, felt it needs, it's it's a weird like I don't even know who to call. I don't even right. you know like and then do I really oh is that important enough? Yeah. Am I bugging him? Is he, you know, <laughs> and this thing. I guess one of the sad parts about this is that there's a psychological um currency of exchange of these favors that it feel really good. And and Scott would have loved to have jumped your car or helped you because all of a sudden psychologically there's a superiority, like I got to mm-hmm. provide you with some assistance or help or coaching or a connection. Because people Feels inherently good. want to help, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's like, it's like I, I mean, I tell my wife um, when we have a party, you know, people want to bring mm-hmm. things. They want to yep. help when they offer. Mm-hmm. They're not offering because they feel obligated. They right. actually want to help. Mm-hmm. And, they, and you're almost doing, I mean, my opinion is you're almost doing them a disservice if you, Absolutely. If you it's don't, disrespectful. If you don't let them. If, Absolutely. If you find something for them. Oh, yeah, you can bring a loaf of bread. Or, oh, yeah, you can bring the, you know, the cucumbers. Yeah. Or you can help me chop the cucumbers. Or you can wash the dishes and, you know. And it, it, you guys can't obviously see Andy's house, but it's filled with Christmas stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so your wife oh, is a God. Christmas fanatic. Yes, she is. Um, but on Christmas morning, uh, universally, humans would rather see somebody else open a present they're giving them. Then yes. open one themselves. Yes. In fact, most people feel vaguely uncomfortable receiving a present. It's like, yes. oh, okay, well, you know, thanks. Right. I love it. But we get so fulfilled and excited to watch somebody else open that present we have for them. But when we don't ask for help from, from our tribe, then we're basically just shutting down that Christmas exchange. How important is asking help? I, Huge. I, I've just, Huge. God, it's so interesting we're having this conversation when we are. I just, I, Yet literally uh, yesterday, um, two days ago, a friend of mine who's in a little, I'm, we're in a little, I'm in a little men's group with uh, like five guys that are just, it literally just started about, I don't know, three months ago. And one of the guys asked for help. He's setting up an Amazon um, account and he needed me to order something in order to legitimize the mm-hmm. fact that he's yeah. signing up for this affiliate account. And, uh, you know, I said, no problem. And then, and, and then I thought, you know, I'm trying to build my podcast audience and I've never asked for help. Yeah. Literally. I've never right. asked anyone for help. I've, I've never, I've never put it out to the people that I know. I haven't even ever really considered the groups of people that would be happy to help. Like never, yeah. really, never considered. So yesterday. And they want to be part of this. They want to be part. I, I guess maybe they do. Maybe they don't, but I've never really bothered <laughs> to ask or find out. So yesterday I, I wrote this up in a little email back to my friend, I'm thanking him for asking, mm-hmm. doing it, and then saying, you know, here's how it landed for me. I love 
love to help you. I wonder who would help me. And um, so I, I composed a, uh, an email and I thought, okay, who could I, who could I start with? If it's not too um, confronting and if it, and if it went totally South and they all told me to go pound sand, it wouldn't matter that much, you know, to me, I'm not that connected with them anymore. And I thought of my fraternity brothers in college, like yeah. love them all. I mean, I can picture all of them. I can, I can imagine one of them showing up my front door and I would let them stay in my house. I would feed them, clothe them, whatever. But it's been 30 years and most of them I've lost touch with. So I wrote this thing out. I said, Hey guys, I, I you never asked for help before, you know, doing this thing. Podcasts really doesn't really matter your guests. It matters r- reviews in iTunes. And that's what gets your mm-hmm. podcast in front of more people. Oh, okay. And, uh, would you guys hear a few episodes? I think you might like, and if you guys would, if you're podcast listeners, if you listen, tune in and write a review, I'd really appreciate it. Here's a link to do it. You know, thanks. And <laughs> I just got this amazing, you know, like thumb, a b- bunch of guys just said thumbs up, you mm-hmm. know, the, are they going to do it? I don't know. But then one of my, one of them who, who I, just, not that, not, not that I should be surprised, but he goes, he runs a fairly large company and he's got sales reps all over the country. He goes, I created a little contest for my sales reps who were out Aww. on the road. He's Isn't like, she? they have to now listen to the podcast and write a review. And the more listens or the more he's like, the more they do, the, the yeah. we're going to have, a, I'm giving away dinner. I'm giving away a, you know, thing. He, he created a little contest for his sales reps. So God knows how many people are going to listen to the podcast as a result. And it just struck me as hey, everybody, like, I want, I want you all to review this podcast. <laughs> I will, exactly. I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you something. <laughs> I started. I started asking. Yeah. I started asking that on the podcast, but that didn't. That doesn't. That feels a lot less threatening to me. A lot less personal, you know. And this was. There was a chance that that they would have said, "Oh, geez, what's that guy up to? Like he we, he's a moron. We don't, you know." Going back to my days of college and the old, the self judgment that comes with with um, you know, what what does he know, you know, and um. It was just a really cool, experience. but it's just so interesting that this conversation is happening about that. That's literally, I got that email this morning about the sales reps listening to the podcast. So, <laughs> and, and the um, <clears throat> tribal cultures are always honor based, and honor is defined as uh, the relationship that you have with another person is more important than your own particular situation. Hmm. So the the we is much bigger than the I. Right. It's a much, much bigger. And and so that honor system is reinforced through that exchange of doing things. In fact, uh, if if I in there's in many cultures, if I were to ask a favor or a certain uh, a gift from you, and then if I repaid it in exactly the same amount, it would be incredibly bad form. Because it, it just killed our relationship, technically. Like, if I had done exactly the same thing for you, you know, that you did for me, no, we're even. We're done. We're mm-hmm. dead. So it actually is... You don't want to... You no, don't want you things don't wanna, to be You eaten. actually want to go, oh, here's a little more. A little you know more, what? I'm going right. to bring your trash can in and I'm going to hand you your mail. Right. <gasps> right. Ooh, I win. I, and I'm, you know, and then you're like, ooh. <laughs> All right, then next week, I'm going to water your damn lawn, Scott. Here I come. Look out. (laughs) (laughs) Help you with your Christmas lights. Right. And then we change the world that way. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Honor. Honor's huge. Honor's a, honor is a, and the, the operating system that we have culturally is called pride. Pride Mm. means what I believe about myself, my job, my, what it, my title, my abs, me, 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 more important than the, the us relationship. So it, my community is a greater source of pride than my own particular role in that community. Yeah. Um, in, again, m- many Paleolithic, you know, ancient tribal systems, there's no language for um, my food, just the food. Or my children. It's just the children. And how many people would you trust to pick up your kids? Like, you know, if you had an emergency, 
and you had to have one of your neighbors take your kid to the hospital or something. Like, who are you calling? Who's who's on your little hot call list yep. of your neighbors who are you know close that you would be willing to go? Hey, listen, I need you to do that thing. Mm-hmm. And so it is important, you know, um, and it's important. I guess practically in that those that type of sense, but also the sen- the that sense of meaning, uh, but to be part of something that's bigger than you, boy, that's a it, that's a, that's a big one. It's a big one socially, and so I know that when people show up to SpaceX, they they're part of something bigger, and the same thing when, you know, I can try to go get in shape myself and deal with my, or I can do it with a bunch of people, who can hold me accountable. And here that's, that's the other big one is we are we are weak fallible ignorant damaged individual people and uh the reality is the lone wolf dies we can't do this thing by ourselves and so our gift is the fact that we're very good collaboratively i know you're good at stuff that i'm not good at i know i've got a few things that i can do that i bring to the table and that's what's our gives us our our strength. That men's group you're you're part of, or your accountability group with the whole life challenge, or your Sparta race, or the mm-hmm. or your church book club. That's the thing. Now, ideally, that should be your job. You look forward to going and supporting and engaging and being defined by your community at work. And it's not as not we don't all have jobs that are uplifting and going to Mars, mm-hmm. and that's valid. However, the way you go about your job, whether it's, you know, you're, you're running a gas station, you can do that in an exalted, uplifting, altruistic, you know, way that we get to be bigger than just a, uh, a currency exchange. Mm-hmm. And to, ha- to have something that's purely transactional, which our lives are, is sad. It's a, it is a soul-crushing experience to be completely transactional you do this i'll do that or i'll I'll pay you a certain amount for that um so we need to have that larger sense of of meaning and purpose even if it's not sexy uh job title or description or i'm a life coach or Mm -hmm. i'm a yoga instructor it's like you you can still find meaning in doing simple things be a great butcher be a great above and beyond person and Matt, boy we all know when we when we meet one of those people who's made your sandwich at subway but is so completely with you you're like mm, that young man's going places right watch right. it like I, I, those are the ones you give business cards to mm-hmm. oh by the way here's my card you know because you made that sa- the hell out of that sandwich or did you just kind of not give a shit and just oh whatever mumbling you can no instantly eye tell you can almost instantly tell before they even do anything mm-hmm. Just as you're just you're sizing them up as you as they make eye contact yep. before any, even anything is, is said. And I always say uh, to these young young men and women, like, thank your parents or your coach. Somebody made you like this, right? Because we're not born like that. Uh, I, we are born with a sense of connection. We're born with us with a lot of hardwired uh, drives, but it uh, human beings are a tabula rasa when we're born. Like we, we are born with a blank slate and we require an operating system to be able to, like you're giving, yeah. well, you, you already have given your son an operating system. Right. It's already, right. at this point it's done. Right. Now all you can do is upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Like, right. hey, I got a book right. for you. Hey, let me give you some feedback. Hey, don't quit. Those are upgrades that we can do. Yep. Um, age three, we get our initial operating system. And you might have gotten a, a weird dog, right? <laughs> That's right. That's like Bella. Yeah. Well, yes. yeah. And then, so we all have a, a particular operating system. And then we are at some point responsible for upgrading ours with what we read, uh, listening to podcasts like this, uh, choosing who we are, want to be around, and being very mindful about social media and everything else that's trying to inject their operating system which is a pretty pretty uh parasitic version yeah 
So that's how we, um, we, we, we can literally upgrade the way that we uh, engage with each other and our lives and our diets and our spirituality, everything. We have that ability. That's that, that will be our salvation if we have one is the fact that we can upgrade our culture to save this planet, this neighborhood, this city, whatever it is. We have the ability to do that. And we're in some ways in a, in a race against people who aren't doing that, right? There are, there are people who are extractive to the planet. I'm trying to get as much as I can. And what is it? The, the, the top five richest men in the United States now own more than the bottom 50% right. of Americans. That's wrong. And that's not a socialist statement. It's simply the fact that that is extractive. You, and those are, those are people who are not playing this uplifting game that we can save the planet. We can do all those things. That it's, so I, I do see there being a bit of a, you know, um, a quest about right. being able right. to carry as many of those people with us as we can. You know, there's that uh, Heraclitus quote of the hundred war, a hundred people going to war. Uh, ninety of them shouldn't even be there. Uh, nine of them are are the soldiers, and thank God for them because they make it a fight. But one of them, that's that's the warrior, and they're going to bring all the rest home. Hmm. So, the minority of humanity. Uh, that's, that's the 90 people that shouldn't even be there. It's like, hey, guys, you're just at whatever stage you're at. You didn't get a good operating system. You're the Buddhists call them hungry ghosts, meaning that they can never eat enough to feel satisfied. No matter how whatever cool car you've got, you will never be fulfilled. They're the hungry ghosts of the phantoms. And then there's those people who are it, that you know that energetically look and feel and act differently and thank God for them because they make it a fight. And then there's the, there's that one that at some point we get to meet and we go, you're the one that's going to take the rest of us home. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Elon. Right. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Right. You know, thank you people who are redefining it and willing to go to bat and bring the rest of us home. Where are my 120 people and how do mm-hmm. I, um, well, how do I define that <clears throat> tribe and how do I, yeah. um, you know, it almost seems like a full-time job to try to figure that out. Yeah. A couple, couple things. I, I, I look at it as you're already existing, your pre-existing groups. And the obvious one for most of us is that we have a job. We have people we work with and those are people that are already have probably a similar mission that's common. Uh, we probably also have, you know, an opportunity to discuss, so what's your real, what, what's your five-year plan? Uh, you know, why, why are you doing this? That five-year plan is usually going to point them towards that vision or their North Star, and then you get a little glimpse into, okay, so that's why you're working at Red Bull or at, at Google. Uh, and then the value system can only really be explored through adversity and adversity i believe uh, it does not build character Uh, adversity reveals the character that is in place and then through reflection and work you upgrade your character Hmm. along with upgrading your operating system you go oh so i um, had these particular goals i had the adversity of I didn't have the nutrition I need, so I just ate whatever was there last night. And that was the adversity, and it led to something of like, oh, so that that happened. Do I want to accept that? And that's, hey, that was great. Celebrate it. Or do I want to change that story? Do I want to change the story of, again, my my diet, my lifestyle, my my meditation practice in the morning or, or whatever it is? Um. So you don't really get to uh, explore the character or value systems of people unless you've had adversity. And that's the trauma bonding that 
you know, we got when we had our military experiences. Yeah. And if you had one sports, when you go, why people go do Spartan races together. Right. Which I think I'm going to actually do on Sunday. I'm kind of terrified. This Sunday? Yes, I'm wow. terrified. Your first one? Yes. How, how long is it? It's one of the short ones. Like 5K? But it's out by, by Castaic, which yep. may have been yep. burned out. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so we'll, I'm, I'm watching the, when nice. I jump off this podcast, I'm going to see my whole Spartan team going, yay or nay. Are they deciding? Water truck Mike, are they shout deciding, out to you. Are they deciding today? Like that's the, the Spartan race is deciding whether to continue? Well, it's center mass of all those fires. Yeah, right. So I'll see if I'm doing a, wow. uh, maybe I'll get a reprieve because you'll see me out there wobbling along that course. Oh, right. Wow. <laughs> um, anyway, adversity it is, we need it. Humans need it. But it, that's interesting. It reveals character, mm-hmm. not builds character. Be- yeah. To build character, you have to do the inner, the inner work. You have to make sense of the experience. Yeah. And that, yeah. and we don't do that very well because we want to go directly to the next activity. Right. So the act of processing, reflecting, reflecting, right. engaging with, you know, all of that, it takes time. And again, looking back at, at the, our paleolithic brothers and sisters, they worked on average of 14 hours a week. That was the general workload to have all of your food, your clothing, your tools, you know, all that handled, which means that, yeah, you wander around and, oh yeah, we're, we just, we'll go. We caught a rabbit and we caught a, or we did whatever we did. And the rest of the time we're spent reflecting, mm. upgrading operating system, talk about the stars, talk about God, share mythology, mm. tell jokes. Um, in our culture, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, there's just not time yeah. to sit and have a long form conversation like you and I are having now. And so if we, do, number one, we've avoided all the adversity like I want my, I don't want, I don't want to intentionally have adversity in my life. I don't want to go to war. I don't want to go fight a cave bear. Yeah, right. But um, that particular activity is what gives us a little marker of this is who you are. Are you a coward, or are you brave? And then, if you are a coward, then then the guys take you out and you go on a little vision quest and you get anointed, and now you go back and do it again. Right. Change the story. Right. But if we have never been tested and you haven't had a chance to reflect on it, then it's much easier just to hide out in your social media. Right. Right. So uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, it, nature abhors a vacuum. Humanity abhors the, the lack of things that we desperately need. We need to be tested. And so, you know, one of the, one of the things that I do for a living is I provide people with ropes courses, which is a chance to go out and put on a harness, do big, scary things collectively that are emotionally triggering. And through that, have big conversations about how do I deal with communication and trust and asking for help and failure and fear. Mm -hmm. So ropes courses are a really bizarre artificial creation that has grown up in the vacuum of our adversity in this world. And so as, again, Spartan races, mixed martial arts, jujitsu, uh, our obsession with sports, these are all sort of weird, dysfunctional, atavistic responses to that need for adversity. Hmm. Um, that, and so, yeah, adversity and uh, reflection time is what uh, reveals and then develops the character so but when you're when you're working with a team, yeah, do you um, so team like SpaceX? Let's mm-hmm. just say SpaceX or Whole Life Challenge. What the heck? Yep. Um, how do you maintain your mission um, focus and your 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 actions forward and your 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 productivity as a team, and also develop the team. You know, like, I mean, I, I'm faced with, we did our leadership development thing, our three day thing, uh, about six weeks ago. We've done nothing since yep. we haven't even taken out the, the sheets that we worked on and the, all the work we did on our mission statement and our values and our, you know, I'm just realizing I'm like, that's all a nice memory now. 
and it was a good time. It was fun. We all connected over all these things, but um, it's not... It wasn't sticky. No, no, it's not. I mean, <laughs> the idea is sticky. Everybody loved it. Everybody wants to do it again. So you don't how have, do you... You don't have to, is why you don't do it. No, n- Right. No... There's no part of the mission that requires us to do yeah, no, and and human beings will never do stuff unless we have to do it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the lone wolf dies is that and if you are a lone wolf, you are starving to death. Mm-hmm. And that's because you cannot hunt an elk by yourself. It takes uh, a minimum of three wolves to pull down an elk. And you can't survive on rodents, I would no. guess. A wolf is well. Yeah. You you can sur- you can survive to a certain point until um, what is ends up starving is your performance, your idealism, your passion, your goals, your beliefs. Eventually, you just get shoved into uh, settling for a life, right? And and and. You may ask yourself that, who's listening to this, or look around you, and you're surrounded by people who have settled yeah. for whatever they just deserve. And so it takes uh, multiple people to be able to go hunt down something exalted. Mm-hmm. And so in all mythology, there is always a crew, a corona, a hunting party, a band, right, of Lord of the Rings, or whatever it is. We need to do this together. Mm -hmm. In Iron John, uh, the hunter goes to bucket out the lake where Iron John is, and he brings back, he brings three good men with him. Right? Mm -hmm. I remember, yeah. That's an analogy, that that we cannot bucket out the lake, which is, that's our subconscious, right? We cannot dig into these problems or these challenges or opportunities that we have by ourselves it's just, it's just not tenable it's not it's not what we do we're not a, we're not these lone uh, animals that like tigers that drift through the jungle by themselves mm-hmm. and they eventually you know will partner to mate and then they go off as these lone predators they're really good at it polar bears same thing that's not humans right. humans are a wolf pack and we're and it's not just and I'm using the analogy of hunting but it's, do I want to establish a spiritual practice? I can't do that by myself. If I, do I want a meditation practice? Do I want to have, do I want to eat cleanly? I can't do that by myself because at some point I'm going to have burned my willpower uh, tank and then I see, oh, there's ice cream right there. Why not? <laughs> Whereas if I have you next to me going, Philip, you said no ice cream that you already, you, you, you said you're working on, you know, right. you got a Sparta race, right. bro. Don't right. do it. Right. I would say thanks. I was weak. Thank you for thanks for being strong for me when I was not strong for myself. I hope I can return the favor, and then some. Right, brother. So we need to have uh, a tribe of people around us to hold us accountable for that, and accountability is terrifying. So how do you do that? Like going back to my original question is how do you how do you do that in a in a in an organization in a in a work environment or maybe yeah. not maybe it's your maybe I mean I I would guess in a club that let's let's say it's a scrapbooking club or something like that um, I would say that having regular meetings mm-hmm. would be part of that of that cult, building that mm-hmm. culture and building that tribe. Um, well, actually, if you're having scrapbooking meetings and you're scrapbooking. You're not really building team. You're you're just doing the thing, kind of like the mission of the whole life challenge is to go out and build the whole life challenge. We're not really working on our team. Mm-hmm. So when do you do the work on the team, or does that just happen by itself? It do, well, a lot of it can be very can be intentional, where people come in and they do that work, and and that role has been held by. Sometimes it's the kings and the chiefs and the boss, the manager, the leader. That's you. Right. And that so you hold that space. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, it is that shaman role. Mm -hmm. It's that person who understands the systems and is willing to tell the stories and really to uh, it. A lot of times it's done through ritual. Like this is what we do every year. 
your wife pulls out boxes and boxes. <laughs> No, like, I pull the boxes out. Okay. Well, she unpacks them and okay. de- and then decorates the house. But I pull the boxes out. The reason for, and I don't, I mean, I, I just walked through the house. If you haven't seen this, it's a beautiful house. Christmas threw up. Oh house. my God. <laughs> this is a pottery barn catalog, people. Absolutely. It's magical. Oh my God. My wife would lose her mind in here. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a good way or not but, so good way? In a good way. No, oh. in a good way. Oh, okay. She loves Christmas. Um, but what's the point? What's the point of all those things? I mean, it's it's it gives her mm-hmm. the sense that uh, it connects her. I would imagine it connects her to the rest of the world. It gives her a sense that uh, that it's the time of year that she connects her back to her childhood mm-hmm. from her spiritual practices yep. in the Catholic Catholic yep. world. Um, it brings back the sense of this magical time yeah. that she gets to share with Dash. Yep. Um, it, uh, it brings her joy. Yeah. It's all ritual, right? It's right. ritual. It's right. symbolism. And that big tree down there is pagan. The things that the, the, the Saint Nicholas is Catholic. The, I mean, so all of those strange, you know, amalgam of Christ mass stuff is ritualistic and it's designed so that there is a meaning and importance placed in this particular holiday season. So some of the ways that work groups go about and maintain uh, their, their focus and recommitment is through ritual. Hmm. And obviously as a Marine, you, you know that your life was dictated by ritual. Yeah. I think I kind of avoid ritual at this point because of, you know, the, 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 there, there were positive elements of the ritual and there were also, okay, let me cut you off real quick. Uh, uh, were you a Marine or are you a Marine? I am a Marine. Exactly. So it's still important. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. still important. Yeah. You are still a Marine. Yeah. Yeah. November, so it defines, November 10th. It still defines it's you. our birthday. You know, like exactly. it, I celebrate yeah. it every year. Yeah, I yeah. play to him. I, so those rituals provided a worldview and identity you identify with that right and you, and in the same way that your wife identifies with this kind of bizarre holiday thing which is yeah. kind of stolen from the celts and repurposed by the christians and a bunch of other stuff was stuck into that um so human beings do need rituals to be able to uh create meaning and you know, sometimes they're as cheesy as employee of the month. Sometimes they're, but they still carry weight. Right. Like right. Uh, you may think employee of the month is cheesy, but any, but acknowledgement from your team is precious. Wasn't it Napoleon that said, if I had, give me, give me, give me the, it's something, some, some, something to the effect of, if I want the greatest army in the world, just give me medals and I'll, I'll just pin them on everybody's chest. Oh, and interesting. Yeah. You know, igno- it's, 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 he's just yeah. pointing to acknowledgement. Yeah. He also said that it, uh, Napoleon said that a dealer or a, a leader is a dealer in hope. Which I think is a great hmm. Napoleon has. So uh, rituals are a big, important one. A creating a uh, an accountability systems is incredibly important as well. And and again, that would be if I have empowered you to hold me accountable for me eating crap, uh, then what I've done is I will, I have, I have instigated some potential conflict in our relationship by doing that, which is the reason why we don't. It's the reason why we don't know all our neighbors Mm -hmm. is that, Oh, it's now it has created the opportunity for conflict. And in our societal system, that conflict is universally bad. It, which means, oh, you just shamed me for eating, you know, ice cream. Well, maybe it wasn't shame. Maybe it was you and I are doing a Spartan race together and you want me to be successful because you want you to be successful. That's we right. want us it's selfish. to be successful. It's, yeah, right. And it's Selfishly not, collective. Exactly. It's, well, both. That's, that's business. Right. That's business. Right. So if I said, yeah, I'm going to have, I'm going to have redone all those marketing plans and I didn't do it. 
because it was a it was a cool thing. But I got behind. It was a lot of work. I probably overpromised. I didn't do it. Well, you know that that's that time where there's some accountability. Mm-hmm. They can come and go. Hey, I just want to at least acknowledge that we said we were going to have something done and we didn't. Um, if we can change the story of all conflict being negative, then that unlocks that whole echelon of behavior, which is called accountability. So how do you create conflict to be healthy? And in the Marines, I'm not talking about the hazing and stuff that was in the paper recently, but yeah. the, um, the accountability that is rampant in the military and in sports from the outside, it looks brutal, but from the inside experiencing that it's, it's jocular, it's ball busting, it, it, it's um, playful. Mm-hmm. It's generally not perceived as being hurtful, right. spiteful. Right. It's basically designed to hold accountability on behavior within the tribe, which right. means finish your reps, bro. I mean, you know, like, yeah. I need you to be stronger. When Which we is go why out and when fight. somebody that's not in the tribe comes in and observes it, yeah, they go and <gasps> judges it. Oh my god! How can you do that? Yeah, you like know? go watch a CrossFit class. It's like, right. oh my god, really? Right. Terrifying. Right. But that's the way that humans operate, and wolves snap and snarl at each other all the time. They just don't bite. Wolves do not bite each other. Mm-hmm. They don't bite each other because they require each other to be able to hunt effectively, and so biting each other is biting themselves and if wolves bit each other then they would go extinct right now since again back to post agriculture if i don't need you if i don't need you like if i don't need your neighbors you know i they might burn right. it's not my job that's not my job it's not my job to know what's going on in afghanistan right now you know right you chose that Here's your GI Bill, and thank you for your service. So it's much easier to disengage, yeah. right? So there needs to be this uh, really collaborative, interlocked uh, accountability stuff that's at the root level is we need, is the, the prey that we're hunting big enough that we actually need to work together? Or, is there, or are we just all getting together because it's conveniently hunting rabbits and we're better? Right? Yeah, right, SpaceX. It's they no joke. To. It no, is it's... no joke. Right. When when you look when you walk into their lobby, and you look at green and green and blue planet, and brown planet, um, that green and blue planet is not Earth. Right. That's Mars. It's Mars. Right. So Re-ima- hello. Reimagine. What are you hunting? What are right. you hunting today? Right. And there's no question <laughs> that what they're up to requires yeah. a massive community. Yeah. And a massive. Com- vision Mm -hmm. for what's possible in the future. Yeah. And if you're not big enough to play that game and if you're, if you're small enough to get, um, you know, abraded by, uh, whatever the dynamics are going on there, then it's, you will probably self select out of that. Right. Right. And there are people who are not developmentally prepared for that. Um, one of my favorite analogies, and I don't know if we want to go down this road, but the, the hero's journey is one of the big lenses through that I view the world through. Mm-hmm. Uh, people aren't willing to go on that journey primarily because we are, are terrified of being isolated. Like we know that it's easier being isolated with no accountability, but we're also terrified, which is why there's so much fear in this world. Like, will I have enough? Will I be okay? And the truth is that that hero's journey analogy has a few guarantees in it, which are repeated throughout all of human experience. And one of those guarantees is that if we proceed to answer the call to adventure and cross the threshold into the road of trials, that big scary thing, saying we're going to Mars mm-hmm. or I'm going to get in shape or whatever it is, we will find our allies. They're the people who have also made that choice. Right. And those are the ones that we're supposed to be around. The ones that are not, God bless them, not willing, ready, prepared to do it. And I have been one and I am one. And I need to hit snooze every once in a while. Mm-hmm. But those of us who have chosen to step across the threshold will look around and we'll see the rest of us out there and go, 
oh, you, where have you been? You know, neighbor, whoever you are. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I, I was waiting for you too. Because, I, you know, I also want to do something cool. I want to be able to borrow your, you know. So the very, thing, the very thing we fear is the thing we're going to find, but we got to be willing to take, this, take the first step. We got to be willing to, to go in in spite of the fear. Yeah, and you're never going to be ready, ever. Right. You, and a lot of times we're waiting. We're waiting to be anointed. We're waiting to be certified. Permission. Permission. Yeah validation uh you know have some successful maybe older person go oh you've received a blessing and it's, now it's time now you yep, can go you go got forth the, you got the black belt you got right, the degree right. now you know you're enough. you're real it's like never will happen never right you we have to do it anyway right, which is why right. they call that you know that call of adventure you have to cross the threshold that's the leap of faith there's a faith component about well it's never gonna. It's not gonna be perfect. We're going to fail, uh, and that's the game. But you fail, and that reveals you, and then you learn from that, and then it happens again and again and again, and Luke is gonna get shocked on that little training thing in the in the Millennium Falcon. Mm -hmm. zzz, zzz, zzz. Like, dude, quit! Just and, uh, until he gets it. Right. And then he becomes a Jedi. Right. And that's the right. that's what we do. If you had never been willing to go, if he had caved under the shaming of Han Solo. Yeah, right. Oh, okay, yeah, I get it. It's a silly thing. I should learn how to shoot a blaster. It's like, no, nope. he was willing to do, receive that kind of load of, of shame. And because of that, it prepared him for whatever the next stage of that training was. Right. So, right. Yeah, we're never ready. How um how have you incorporated this vast experience and knowledge yourself in your life? Like where where have you seen where have your struggles been and and where have you had to really kind of develop this and work with this? Uh <clears throat> I'm constantly doing that uh, also and I'm failing regularly for um you know for your son dash for my my daughter makai uh, i i look at them as members of my tribe mm -hmm. and i need to do this for them i need to fail in front of them right i right. need to get the shit kicked out of me and fall to my knees and then i need to stand up dust off and step back into the arena and have it happen again and again. Mm -hmm. And then they need to see when my victory happens, they go, oh, it wasn't easy for dad. Right. right. He got the shit kicked out of him. And that's the lesson. We are, we're, we're, we're not we're, mentoring. Give me, an, give me an example of that. What, where are you getting your, the shit kicked out of you? Yeah, we're, so we're modeling yeah. for everyone around us. Yep. We're not mentoring, we're modeling. And, uh, and so, you know, for me, the um, starting my own company, huge, huge transition of uh, am I, you know, am I legitimate? Am I authentic? Am I, you know, I'm not a business person. How do I do these things? How do I do these things? What is SEO? How does one go about doing that thing? Right, right, how do, how right. do you do a, a successful podcast? How do you, do, there's all these things that, um, if I was waiting to understand everything about business, I would never have started my own business. Right. right. And, and again, that's that leap of faith. And I'm attempting to be as realistically transparent with my challenges and my adversities on, on my social media, mm -hmm. with my daughter, with my tribe. I'm like, hey, guys, this is a tough time, hard day for me. Mm -hmm. Didn't know, don't know what I'm doing. Made some mistakes. Uh, hopefully I learned from those mistakes and then transcended. So, you know, I, I, there's a lot of different arenas. I, I would, I keep referring back to kind of the diet stuff. I'm not, I'm not eating as clean as I should be. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to, um, you know, be walking around with your abs. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> You've got them. Well, you just might not somewhere. see them. Yeah. They're there. Yeah. 
like a they polar, do exist like a polar bear <laughs> it's, like a chiseled it's, polar bear like, like maybe like a seal <laughs> yeah they have abs or a walrus yeah i don't know i don't know if they do actually so so what what's i mean for that's an example of well i know what to do i know what not to do so what's stopping me from getting to that point well what's stopping me is i have not implemented my tribal system with that particular arena. Mm -hmm. This is, this is where you jump in and you say you're that you're part of the, you are whole life challenge. Whole life Uh, challenge. Here it is. Here it is. Let's go. That was your segue (laughs) right there. (laughs) So, um, if I, again, and my, this Sparta race was a, you know, and thank you, water truck, Mike, he's the guy that invited me to go do this. Um, this is how people, this is why CrossFit works. Right. It is right. a room full of people who are looking at the same board going, all right, let's do it. Right. Because you know if you're in a garage by yourself, you're not doing it. Yeah, Hell no, no. You know what's very funny is that I had not experienced that before. I, you know, been doing CrossFit since 2004. And I, um, when I sold the gym, I, I bought all this equipment, put it in my garage, and, uh, you know, basically set up mm-hmm. the ability to do pretty much anything I could do in the gym I could do here. Mm-hmm. And, um, Started to use it. Actually, I never used the barbell. I, I have I had barbells sitting in my garage for a year, and I never touched them. Um, and uh, and then realized that I missed the community. I missed the people. I missed the camaraderie of the class. I didn't I didn't really appreciate the importance of that. Yeah. You know, like I mean, I did theoretically. I did logically, but I, I I hadn't experienced it. And then I started going back to back to class again. I started to miss. I was I was missing workouts. I was I was not doing anything. Yeah. And I and I started to go. And the value to me that that the the agreement that at twelve thirty this begins. Yeah. That was a big one for me. Like, I can have agreement with myself that it begins at twelve thirty, but I don't necessarily honor that agreement. Mm-hmm. And the agreement that everybody's going to show up and that everybody's going to, just by being there, they're holding me accountable. They don't have to yep. do anything. No. They don't have to tell me, they don't have to tell me to go harder, tell me to go easier. They're just, just their presence. Yep. Yep. And, um, it's that's a tribal at its core, which is, which is funny. Um, I just bought Julia a Peloton spinning bike for Christmas mm. and, um, it's having, it has, they have built in a similar effect with this. They've got this, screen this television screen on it and you can connect to live classes mm-hmm. all around uh, from new york you can connect to the library of past classes through the calibration of the machine you see the um you know the cadence and the the power and the output watt output and you kind of see where you compare they've built a community inside of this bike that's not so it's not just an inanimate object that's collecting dust and clothing you know that yeah. happens to most people's spin bikes in their in sure. their garage so um, that, that, that community element, that accountability element is so big. Yeah. It, I, I, I don't do well with the spin class. I went, my wife brought me to one mm-hmm. the other day. It was tough. It's tough. It was a little too clubby for me. Yeah. yeah. Ish, ish, ish. Well, that's what's nice but, about the, having it on your own. You I can, could feel the tribal vibe in there. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, it was like, why else would you sit on a bike and it doesn't go anywhere and right. suffer? For 45 minutes. Oh, it's or an hour horrible. Even. Yeah, it's horrible. But I did I did a 12-hour spin once. No. This is 12 years ago, 13 years ago. It was like an endurance thing with Johnny G and Holy this whole thing. And oh. it's horrible. I mean, just it's just not fun. It, not no. horrible in the sense <laughs> of, like, that was hard. Like, I'd much rather go out and spend 12 hours trying to get from here to the northern end of the Santa Monica Mountains yeah, totally. than to sit on a bike in a room uh, for that, 12 but, hours. But, yeah, it was a thing to do. I, how I, I rationalized it is I could imagine 50 people sitting in a cave drumming. Yeah. That was how I kind of got my mind around it. Right, I sat in the right, back of the right. room. Ish, ish, kind of, I'm like, okay, so like hey, look what it me. is. Yeah, I'm just drumming. Yeah. I'm just drumming. Yeah. But uh, anyway... Um, my wife's big with that and it, it is very tribal. I get it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I, I think it's one of the big secret things and obviously it, there's nothing radical or revolutionary about, yes, we need people. Yeah. I, I think what surprised me is how intertwined and connected it is to everything. 
everything, our diet, our exercise, our spiritual practice, our sense of meaning, our purpose. Uh, you know, human beings have what's called mirror neurons, which is a type of neuron that is designed to trigger and fire when it's in connection with other humans, which is, this is the kind of technical explanation of empathy, hmm. compassion, mm -hmm. right? Compassion. So, I mean, we're wired for connection, literally wired for it. If we don't have it, it makes us feel very uncomfortable, hmm. right? Uh, I was, I've been reading uh, Brene Brown this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's genius. Phenomenal, phenomenal, Holy yeah. macaroni. Yeah. I kind of dodged her for years because it was, I knew it was going to be icky, mm -hmm. deep dive, gooey. Mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be all the stuff that I, I generally avoid. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't seem like you avoid gooey stuff. I know. I, I work, I'm working really hard. Huh? I'm working hard on it. Like it would be much easier to, to uh, throw the spinnaker up and sail yeah. away yeah. from the wind. Yeah. But I know all the gold <laughs> is going. Right, directly into it. Right. Oh, I fight it. But um, Brene talks about the the word compassion as being, uh, I, I'm I'm suffering with you. Right. And right. Of right. course, um, like, yeah. I, of course, we avoid that. Why do I want? Right. Why right. do I want to suffer? Right. Keep right. your shit to yourself. I don't want to suffer with that. Right. But mm, if I want to be, com if I if I want to ha be compassionate, right? I mean, this is Christ-like, well, Buddhist. This is the highest level of spirituality. It's the difference between compassion or the distinction between compassion and sympathy, right? Like yeah, sympathy, right. there's you're not suffering with someone. Right. You're su you're watching them suffer <laughs> externally, and you're much easier you're sitting above them much and easier. having sympathy for them while they yeah. go through their struggle. And then, hey, check out this one. Self-compassion, which means I'm going to really fully experience my suffering. Right. Oh. Right. Both of those things, for me, was a bit of a call out. Like, oh, oh. so if I'm, if I'm going you know, to be compassionate, I'm going to suffer along with that person empathetically. And, you know, if I'm going to be self-compassionate, I'm going to take a real look at my own emotional situation and these are all things that boy men struggle with in general yeah. societally we struggle with yeah in a much bigger sense we we don't cry well we don't we don't have a chance to express our fear in our society we almost never express fear we never express sadness we express anger yeah we bundle them make right. anger right. and so our you know we have a strange cathartic uh, industry that has sprung up to scare us or to make us cry, right? Sad movies, sad, you know, tragedies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really, whereas that's sh supposed to be an inherent part of our culture. Right. Like, oh, right. I'm really sad. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm really afraid. But we don't uh, have the permission to express that societally. So kind of that's why compassion is dead. That's why it's such a struggle to be compassionate. Right. Yeah. Right. What are some of the practices you do each day to help keep you in the fold mm. personally? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have my little, a lot of people have written about this, my hour of power in the morning. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, every morning uh, my wife and I wake up like, an hour before we wake up our daughter. Right. We. What time do you wake up? Uh, usually five thirty. Okay. 5 Set 15, the alarm. Five thirty. Or, or yeah. do you just wake up? Oh yeah. Up? Set the alarm. You don't wake. You don't just wake up at five thirty. No. Good lord. Yeah. I'm a slovenly sea mammal. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and I don't hit snooze. Mm -hmm. I don't hit snooze, and I think that just prolongs the suffering. It's like right. get up. Right. Don't think. Just get up. Yep. And then we do a, a a little beverage that I've tried to gather all the smart people. Maybe you can add to this, but I, I do uh, lemon juice, cayenne pepper, turmeric, mm -hmm. and apple cider vinegar. Great. In kind of a little beverage. So we drink that, and then we 
make our bulletproof coffee mm -hmm. and then we stretch and then we meditate. And that whole cycle takes about 40, 45 minutes. Yeah. And you do it together. Yeah. The two of you. Yeah. So oh, that's that, cool. That's, that's kind Our of a morning ritual, our morning ritual. And, and if I didn't do all those things, uh, and I was waiting if they were to do them when it becomes convenient, I probably won't knowing myself yeah, and knowing most people that I work with, most people won't, won't, uh, meditate. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm one of those, I have a hard, out. it's funny because, uh, I just read, I was watching this documentary, uh, about the, uh, Marathon monks. I don't know if you've ever known much much about them. They uh, at one in their training, they over seven years they have to they have to engage in hundred day stints each year. Hundred day stints in the first four years, and then two one hundred day stints in years four and five, and then seven um, of a marathon distance or mo longer hike or yeah. fast paced run every right. day every every one of those hundred days so you know this monk would get up at two thirty, two o'clock in the morning and do his marathon first thing and then come back and do the whole day right. his whole all the chores of the living in the monastery and all the things that come along with that and then go to bed and the next day he gets up at 2 30 in the morning and first thing he does is go for his uh sick it takes about six hours yeah. for him to do this and I, and I thought to myself god i'm such a pussy I, I can't, I can't even keep 10. I can't do 10 days of 10 minutes of meditation. Yeah. All right. Not yet. I'm, I won't say that I can never, but, um, I, you know, and the other, the other piece of the commitment for these monks is it, 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 it once they've taken on this, um, this, um, I don't know what you, this commitment, you know, it's a pilgrimage to become yep. the closest thing to a living Buddha there mm -hmm. that there is. It's a seven year period. Once you've taken it on, the the punishment for quitting is death. Nice. Suicide. So you, you <laughs> either hang yourself or you know, Harry Harry Carey. You know, one or the other. Yeah. So there's a there's also a, this level of I have to do this oh, or I'm gonna die. Yeah. And it's 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 unbelievable. It's un, I mean th this documentary uh, captured the seven year process of this monk doing yeah. it. He made it's like it. burning he your ships. It. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to capture the island, burn your ships. Right, you ain't going home till you got it. Yeah, burn your ships. So anyway, so so you know, so yeah, the meditation. meditation thing is a tough thing to. I always can. I typically convince myself that I have about seventeen other things that are more important to do than just sit and do nothing for ten minutes. Yeah, and uh, those went out most of the time. Those went out at least up until now. Yeah, it's it's actually not doing. It's not doing nothing. Meditation, right? No, I know. Um, in my head, that's know, the conversation I, in my head that yeah. it is doing nothing. Uh, it's it's actually a it's actually a workout. You change that. Story. Sure. Okay. Um, the, the it's actually practicing the act of disidentification. Hmm. So it's it's exactly the same thing as CrossFit or anything else. Is that when you're meditating? Uh, the act of meditating is to train yourself to catch when you are having a thought or an emotion or a sensation and then disidentifying from that. Mm -hmm. And so in my case, I, it's tw I do 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's 20 minutes of, oh, I just had a thought. Oh, I just had a sensation. And keep going back to breath right, or mantra. Right. And it's hard. Do you do it's it, very do you uncomfortable. Do it with music? It's hard. Do you do it with background music? Or yeah, with... I like a little music. A yeah. little something droning and nonverbal. Uh -huh. um, like chanting or something? Yeah. Or... And then and I'm just doing bare attention meditation where I'm counting my breaths. Yep. I never get past two or three. <laughs> right. Without having a thought that... Yeah. I, at yeah. some point I start thinking about, oh, that email I've got to do or, yeah. oh, my, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then I go... Sometimes I'm going down the rabbit hole of thoughts for God knows God. how many breaths. Yeah, right? it could have been yeah. could have been five minutes of me just like spacing out and looking at my trailer in my backyard, like, oh, I need to really wash that. And then like, oh, isn't man. it funny? Like, and oh, then wait a second. nope, yeah, count right one, right, right two, and then I fidget. Yeah. Oh, I was just fidgeting. I just caught myself. So the act of of training that skill set 
to disidentify is the act of being able to become the witness so that as the day progresses and that person cuts you off in traffic and then flips you off instead of just reacting to that person by oh all right buddy here it's on i'm gonna punish you for the rest of this drive I can go, hmm, oh, I'm angry now. Look at me. Look at me having that experience. I'm going to choose something else. And that is the how we give the opportunity to upgrade our operating system. That's the awareness piece. We can right. all do it. Right. We just have to elevate above being immersed in the river of our day before we can actually step out and go, oh, let's take a different route down the river, you know? Or let me step on the bank for a minute and, and take some self-care time. Or let me portage around this crazy rapids that always kicks my ass and makes me eat ice cream. Yeah. I'm going to take. I'm gonna actually go carry the canoe around this time. Yeah, right. And mm-hmm. I'm not even going to go to that party because I know I overdrink right. or whatever the story is. Yep. So, so, yeah, you have this, so you have this hour in the morning. Yeah, where I you... handle all that. And I, I, I do believe that uh, big shout out to the, the Bulletproof Coffee. I've been doing it for about two years. Yeah, it's good stuff. Seems to have made me remarkably lucid mm-hmm. mentally. And um, my you know my weights hit a, a plateau where it's like, it's I'm there. And, well, it and gives energetically, you, it gives I'm good. You that, it gives you that solid fat mm-hmm. uh, foundation in, in, in the morning, yep. particularly that, that's, that's really, really helpful. And I think it slows down the speed at which caffeine enters your system. Mm. Um, it... It, when I drink coffee with butter in it and with MCT oil or coconut mm-hmm. oil or whatever I do, um, I don't get the jitters. I don't, I don't have the same kind of feelings that I get when I just have a cup of coffee. Right. It's really different. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So seems to be a good one. I, I, it's one of those that has worked for me and I'm, I'm willing to try just about anything. Yeah. Right. That I'm like, Oh, Hey, that, that's going to give me a little, a boost or a different perspective. And, and, like if you told me, let they, I'm going to pull out this power crystal and we're going to see if it opens our shot, you know, third, I'll, I'll try it. Right, right. You know, um, I'd like to know a little bit about the science behind it sure. and I, but, but I'll give, give it a, it a shot. shot. Yeah. Give it like, a shot. It, right. uh, or if you brought in a palm reader, going to read my palm and help me out with my, I'm open to it. Um, but if it doesn't work, then, you know, I, I will dismiss. Sure. Right. So there, there has it has to be grounded in some sort of efficacy and science and all that stuff for me. So, but I've read uh, Dave Asprey's book, you know, that bulletproof mm-hmm. thing, and and that 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 one sold me, and then it works. Right. Meditation has been around for five thousand years. Right. It works. Right. Um, right. I've been dodging yoga for a while now. Mm-hmm. I, I've tried it. Hurts my shoulder really badly, so I kind of mm-hmm. avoid it. But I should be doing yoga too. So what are the other things that you find in your day that keep you sharp and keep you in this uh, in this game? I reach out to my people, and it sounds very mercenary uh, to go, oh, yeah, I carve out time or I schedule time to, to reach out to my people. Mm-hmm. But are you, your people meaning my your tribe. work people? Uh, your, both, whatever it is. So you, you have know. multiple, you'll have your work tribe, you'll have a yeah. personal connection tribe. Yeah, and at one point, I had uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Stephen Johnson from the Men's Center of uh, Los Angeles. He said, if you remove alcohol, sports, and your job, men don't have friends. Jeez. Just let that one float for a minute for your Whoa. audience. Ouch. If you remove alcohol, sports, and, and your, your job, job, you don't have friends. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. Yeah. So... Yeah, I, I know. It's not entirely true for me, but but I, but it, you're right. It takes away about ninety percent. Yeah, it was takes pretty close. <laughs> and and then you factor that in with the lone wolf dies, right? And you don't have friends, like re- for real. And it's not enough just to know the name of your neighbors. You right. need to go a little more than that. And and so I actually went through my phone, and I I looked at all these men that I know and admire and that I like and I'm like that's my that's a friend uh and I have no him. no particular connection and I with him. work no particular connection with sports <clears throat> no particular connection with although they could be it was but it was beyond that yeah it was yeah. to say yeah I do work with you but um 
listen, if you need me to pick up your kid, I'll pick up your kid. Right. Call right, me. Right, right. You know, it's like, I got a truck. You need me to move something? Call me. Right. Uh-oh. That's the, uh, I know, you, right? Don't put your phone number out on this right. podcast. <laughs> It was scary to say <laughs> Jesus. it. The okay, case, but the so yeah, I I did. I called a bunch of my you know my people. Um, that like you know Clark. Yeah, Clark is a genius at maintaining relationships. So really he's is, one of yeah. those guys that I model. Um, you know, can I, Clark. He, Clark has you know four hundred friends, and he goes out to you know three functions a night. Right. And so, right. But, but he's gift. He's really really connected and good and and all that so, so you actually people, schedule time you actually put time in your calendar yeah to connect you, yeah and you it indicate might be, who they are and it might be a be. text just, it might be just a reach out, hey checking in Andy, how you doing brother hope right. you're hope you're good right um what are you working on or, or whatever it is yeah and you know it, it's a it just is a way that keeps things connected and and i will well it's a practice it's I mean, a I'm, practice i'm getting i'm getting yeah. a lot from mm-hmm. what you're saying it's mm-hmm. it's um and you actually have, from a work perspective, you have to schedule it yeah. because, you know, something dies in that space. Yeah. So you have to be willing to go, this is more important than yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So um, have, have coffee, go out and go to the beach, Do, plan a workout. Uh, if you're at work, you know, take, take 20 minutes and debrief last quarter or, um, talk about what you're working on this week or what scares you, uh, you know, find some alignment about those things. Yeah, right. And, and that is the work and we have to develop some, some people are better at it than others. I'm not good at it. So I do have to make myself engage. I also ha- um, am right now working on saying yes to just about everything. Hmm. Now for a lot of people who don't have healthy boundaries, that's the opposite of what they should be doing. Right. For me, I I tend to avoid and isolate, and I won't come out and do a podcast. Right. Huh. right? But interesting. If somebody says, "Hey, you want to do a Spartan race?" Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever done? Hey, a you want to go climb no. Everest? Uh, when was the last time? Uh, you, yes. Uh oh. Yeah. When was the last time you ran five miles? Mm, I don't know. I don't right. know if I can run right. five miles. <laughs> right. But you got you got to be a little careful with that well, saying yes. But wow. Yeah. So you want? Yeah go to a, a function or a, like a, I don't like functions. Right. But if you ask me to go to a function, Hey, I've got a bunch of guys. We're going to go do this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so that's interesting. Th- that there is a networking um, and it's not a hustle piece. Yeah, it's yeah. just about, you know, my, no, I think you have to be very intentional about choosing the people that you say yes to with. Yep. Right. Yep. And there's yep. some African proverb about if you want to go, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Mm. So my, mm. I don't say yes. Oh, I love that. I don't say yes to, you know, to the unwashed masses. Yep. I say yes to uh, the men, women who are in my tribe who are saying, hey, you should meet this guy. Yeah, right. Or you should go. Right. Let, do you want to go? Most of the time when that happens, I'm like, okay, it's good for me. Yes. Okay. Right. If it's a good for me, we all know it's good for us. We all know it's not good for us. What allows us to act on that is, you know, being the witness of our life and meditation has been clutch for that. Yeah. It is certainly I identify in, and I, I post hole into emotions and thoughts and busyness, but the act of meditation has allowed me to be much more, uh, Equanimous, equanimous, equanimity, neutral, being able to that's, choose that's better. Yeah. and, yeah. and so that's been a, a really valuable component for me as well. Philip I journal a lot too. Oh really? Yeah. Do you, is that part of your morning practice or do you do uh, that? No, no. It's, you, it's throughout the day. I've got this big, this beautiful journal. Oh yeah. It's nice. And I'll burn through one of these. Do you journal. write in it? Do you have particular things you write about? Do you have prompts or do you just something happen and you're like, oh, I got to write about that? I use that as um, a means of kind of symbolically organizing my life. So mm-hmm. a lot of times it's there's a to do piece and there's priorities. But there's also if I heard a, a great quote or a topic or a conversation piece, I'll write that down or a book. Yeah. 
Um, I, I built in. So it's a note taking mm -hmm. function, but it's also a place to c reflect. Yeah. And it's a, there's a crystallizing aspect of writing, which is important. Yeah. It just is. A, it's a way that we take ideas and we you're you're literally putting ideas into the world by writing them down. Mm -hmm. You're making mm -hmm. them real. Right. I mean, what's in that book right now? It exists. It exists. And it exists in a bunch of symbols that I have. It, it's almost uh, magical, right? Um, magic is manifested through spells. When we, we say abracadabra, something happens. Mm -hmm. I think actually uh, abracadabra is a Hebrew word that means I create what I say is abracadabra but when humans do that all the time when i say i i dislike you now i have when i say those words it actually changes you physiologically like your your hypothalamus dumps out a whole bunch of cortisol and adrenaline like oh oh it doesn't like me and then if i say i love you that just those sequences of sounds are interpreted in a way that now our hypothalamus is going to put out a bunch of oxytocin and serotonin. So we're casting spells all the time yeah. well, with our words, with our language, our body posture. And the majority of it is nonverbal. The spells that we say are only like 10%. The rest of it is I, I, I look down at your, your shitty car. Oh, <laughs> mm, I dismiss you. And you're like, oh, you're less than. Right. right? That, that's right. a spell. I just cast a spell at you. Mm. So writing is you know, scribing this, this reality of the world and creating it. And so is speaking it. Yep. So as, as we move through the world, we model behavior. We, we model self care. We model, um, what am I doing with my life? And I'm giving permission for other men and women to be able to do that as well. Yeah. So that it, that's a, I think that there is a bit of a vanguard and responsibility of those of us who are, who have access to this. You and I are not any smarter than anybody else, and neither is Joe Rogan or Marcus Aubrey or mm -hmm. um, Tony Robbins. Right? They just got the grace of being connected to role models and information that was uh, uplifting. Well, and then and they're willing, and they're willing to do something about it. Well, even that that's the other piece, even they're, that willingness. You know, they got a, that. They got that. They too. got that. Right. And they, for whatever reason, you know, they're that confluence of. You know, the adversity and darkness and, and trauma from their youth, which drove them. Yep. Your life wasn't easy. No, right. And I don't even know you. But I know that there's nobody who is as hustly and successful unless they were broken. Yeah. Right? Yep. And I'm the same. And and so is everybody else listening to that, is that if you have shame about your past because it was hard or you failed or whatever, the opposite should be true. That's the access to all the rocket fuel of your yeah. life is the adversity you went through, but don't stop in it. The, the, I mean, the, the people I know who are, you know, drug addicts, murderers, um, you know, just horrific thing and been through the woods, gotten through mm -hmm. to the other side. The only way out is through. True. Those yeah. are the most exalted, uplifting, extraordinary people in the world. Absolutely. You listen to yeah. listen to Tony Robbins. Listen to his backstory. Yeah, right. He exists because of his trauma. Right. And the same thing is true for all of us, is that if we can mine the darkness and the shadows, that's where all of that all that gold sits. That's that iron John. Yeah, the, we have to dip our wounded finger into the pond. Philip, if someone wanted to is here in this podcast and wanted to engage at a deeper level, um, yeah. just by learning, what what books would you point them to? Oh, okay, a little reading list. Um, if you, if anybody, uh, and this is not a shameless plug, but if you, oh, I want you to do a okay, shameless shameless plug. plug. So <laughs> my website, website is yeah. philipfolsom dot com. If you sign up for my newsletter, oftentimes I'll post stuff about reading lists and whatever I'm cool. working on. So. Cool. Um, so reading lists are of vital importance. I read every day. And uh, I think the top CEOs in the world read 40 books a year. Yeah. So um, I don't read 40 books a year. Uh, in fact, I'm the older I get, the slower I'm reading because mm -hmm. I'm digesting and trying to implement. Yeah. And so I think uh, I finished Sapiens such last a, week. I think it probably took book. me, you know, 
four months to read it because I read three pages a night. And I have the trouble uh, now b- with with podcasting and have my podcast guests. A lot of them are authors, hmm. and so I want to read at least some of their books oh, before yeah. I have them on the podcast. So my reading, my the amount of reading that I do has skyrocketed in yeah. the last probably like eight months, mm-hmm. and I don't get to necessarily finish the books I really want to. Like I started Sapiens and I got about a third of the way through yeah. and it's sitting on my shelf because I've, you know, I'm reading Chris Kessler's book. I'm reading Rob Wolf's book. I'm reading, um, I'm reading Dr. Fung's book. Who's coming up for a podcast. I'm, you know, all these people, which have let me absolve you a little bit though. Um, you know, Sapiens Harari, he, he, um, he came out of the gate strong on Sapiens and yeah. it, do, but it does Peter off. Oh, huh. like, so about halfway through, I, I was kind of like bogging down going, okay, hmm. I don't really want to care about that. I've heard the next book. <laughs> my mom loves the next book. Oh. Another friend of mine yeah. told me, he's like, yeah, the next book's very depressing because it goes Ooh, into Homo Deus. Fu- Homo Deus. Yeah. It goes into the kind of the future and yeah. AI. And, you know, if you're going to live it and we're going to live at least some of it, mm. uh, it can be quite depressing. But oh. um um, I haven't dug into that one yet. I've heard it's, heard it's good. Anyway, what was what, what? What are some of the books you would say? Just if if nobody else even goes to your website, yeah, just tell them now. What 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 should they read? All right, if you are a man, or you are a woman who wants to know what the hell is going on with us men, Iron John. Uh, this is one of the one of the books you and I both talked about. Yeah. Iron John is a book about men. It's by Robert Bly. It's not yeah. a light read. I I, I have trouble. Yeah, it's a slow read for me. Very slow and very, it's deep. Um, it's a it's a explication, which is a fancy word for it, it explains a old myth called Iron John, which has been around for several thousand years, and it's it it talks about the symbolism and unlocks the mysteries of what's going on with men. So profound book and it's different every time you read it so you probably should as men all you young men who probably are not listening to this podcast but uh, <laughs> like if you're 20 who knows maybe yeah, who knows? maybe not who knows? but uh, that book will be different than if you read it and when you're 30 or when you're 40 or yeah. when you're 50 so yeah. I'm looking forward next year I'll read it at some point so we got Iron John Iron John um, anything by Joseph Campbell uh, and a nice accessible one is The Power of Myth talks about the hero's journey Talks about uh, all of those just profound mysteries and resets, and 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 he's a he's a genius. He's a master. So uh, I think that that's the type of information that will be our salvation at some point. It is a reset of what's important. So uh, yeah, Joseph Campbell, the power of myth is brilliant. Um, boy, Eckhart Tolle is brilliant too. Uh-huh. Like he was one of the first ones. That power kinda, of now. Yeah, that's his original one. Yep. And he's got a whole slew of other ones. Uh, yeah, anything by the Dalai Lama is great. Uh, but for some reason, like the, I believe Eckhart Tolle is, it, my sense of is that he actually had a crystallizing spiritual epiphany. Hmm. And he talks about it. And he talks about it in almost the same language that Buddha talked about his. Hmm. And and Christ talked about his. Mm-hmm. There is a similar, you know, death and rebirth yep. Um, yep. A, a cycle that goes through this. And so what's interesting about Eckhart Tolle that, and I'm not saying he's a prophet or he's a messiah. I, he just had a, he had a psychic break with reality, which many people who, again, who have been in the darkness mm-hmm. have had, and they were forced to look at life in a different way. And then like at some point, if you're going to die from diabetes and go, Hey, there's no more McDonald's. <gasps> oh, okay. I just I just never ate it again. I and I didn't smoke anymore. And I realized that I'm an alcoholic. I don't drink. So that that's a there's a sometimes a moment of crystallizing happening that changes the course of a life. Yeah. So he did that with with his spiritual life. And, you know, and at some point he became a spiritual teacher. And and he is relevant because he did it right. recently. Right. And I think there's been men and women throughout history. And he's, who, and he's written about it recently, I'm guessing. Yeah. And he and there's been men and women throughout history who have had weird spiritual awakenings and they've either become saints or we've burned them alive or yeah. we've, whatever we, we did. He's doing it right now. Yeah. And so when you're reading his work, you're going, okay, so I could stick this man in any era and just change his language and he fits right in with all that. Right. Right. So 
you know, for me, I, I look at some like that's somebody who is, you know, he's doing that monastic hundred mile hike. Yeah, right. And he and it's not a question for him. He's fully integrated that into his life. Yeah. And I think uh, the most of us are, you know, attempting to integrate that while still living life like you and I are living. Oh, we're successful, normal men yeah. who are attempting to bring in certain aspects of altruism or spirituality or um, optimization, but we're not all in. Right. We're, we're <laughs> right. still, right. Um, and even Buddha talked about this, of the, that middle road. Mm-hmm. Like you want to be, you want to be in the world, but not of the world. Right. Right. And, and Eckhart Tolle was not, you know, he was not in the world until he came back and was like, okay, I sat on a park bench for three years and now I decided that I'm going to be a spiritual teacher. Hmm. Okay. So, um, I'm never going to do that. I will, I will, I'm in the world. And, but because that gives me a unique position that I do get to, you can learn Well, you can learn from that. And yeah, yeah, I'm in the castle. If I'm wandering around in the wilderness, I don't get to change the conversation. Right. I am in the marketplace. I am, uh, you know, rubbing shoulders with the masses, getting my ass kicked. But because of that, I at least I get to participate in the conversation. Right. And right. and I, I guess I'm built for that at this moment in my life. You are more than built for that. I mean, it, I, you know, we've been going, this is probably the longest podcast I've ever done to date. And uh, <sighs> might be, might be. I don't know. It's maybe tied. I, I try to keep them under, you know, like, 75 minutes we've been way longer than we really minutes. did we went in a little time warp yeah we did and and i love i love that i i um i get care i easily get carried away and this one i don't think i got carried away just that's where we needed to go and yes uh, i really appreciate your time and your 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 knowledge and your willingness to share it with the world and your willingness to maybe go outside your comfort zone and do a podcast yeah um um, how, so you already plugged your website. Yep. Is that the best way to find you? Or are you uh, also on I guess social the media? Big one is I, my, my North star is I, I want to heal the world as much as possible. So if you're listening to this and you know, a, um, an organization, a church, a sports team, or a, even a, a work group that's underperforming or suffering, then I would be very happy to, uh, partner with you about any of any of the work that, I have at my disposal, whether that be working with the wolves, horses and archery ropes, courses, any of those things, or even like we talked about a a simple reading list, but that's, that's what I'm on the planet for at this moment. So it'd be an honor to work with anybody who's uh, listening out there. And people find you Philip Folsom.com. Philip Folsom.com. Yeah. Uh, Philip with one L and then Folsom like the prison. Yep. And then uh, you social media. Are you on Facebook? You're on Twitter and all this stuff. Yep. I'm just exploring LinkedIn right now. It's really a cool, powerful platform. It is. I know. I, and I kind of avoided that for a while, but there's a lot of so. them. Twitter, there's LinkedIn. There's I don't Facebook, understand Twitter. It's, it's, I, like just uh, Instagram. Those little I, 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 this Snapchat. Like texting with my you, don't, you haven't done Snapchat yet. Have no, you? my God. <laughs> oh, my. The only reason I, I think to learn Snapchat is for our kids. We need to know. Oh, what my daughter does Snapchat. Yeah, I know. I don't know understand. I even tried to open the app and I couldn't even navigate through it. Yeah. So I like. I would, hey, Snapchat, if you want, I will absolutely work with it and I will learn your app. Philip okay. Folsom. Philip Folsom. <laughs> <laughs> Find him on Snapchat. Well, my, da- my daughter does do lots of fun things on Snapchat. So, uh, uh, Philip, thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Uh, just uh, blessings. And hey, the one of the things I like to close programs with is, is a, it's an old uh, quote by Hillel. And it is, if I am not for myself, then who will be? If I am not for others, then what am I? And if not now, when? So take care of yourselves, serve others, and this is your time. Don't wait. I love that. All right. Thanks. God bless. The Whole Life Podcast is produced by our podcast team, Winslow Jenkins, Becca Borowski, and Ernie Hurtado. You can find all of our episodes, links, and complete show notes at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. The way that I've found is the best way to listen to podcasts is to subscribe so that episodes automatically get delivered right to your mobile device. You can do that in any podcast app on your phone. And hey, if you like the podcast, please do me a favor. Go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating and recommend it to your friends. I'm Andy Petronic, and thanks so much for listening. Listening.